So where's the office back at Division? You're in the office, baby. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? What time is it? <laughs> I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story. Now Myers should win the league, yes! And I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. Damn, Dad! Well, hello and welcome to the Below the Rim show, a show dedicated to the BBO. It's me, Pabs. I'm joined as always by my main man, Ads. How are you, sir? I'm all right. It's Friday night. It's not been the best of weeks, but what better way to make things all right than have a chat with my old mucker, Pabs? Absolutely. Uh, I think this is uh, this has been long in the making, hasn't it, really? And... Uh... We've been chatting about just doing a kind of a, almost like a life and basketball style podcast. I'm enjoying your t-shirt, by the way. For those of you listening on a podcast right now, uh, Michael's secret stuff is currently... Not, oh, it's a brand 161 only as well. Nice. Have you not seen that one? No, I haven't seen that one. I want that one. I will print one off for you. It's uh, This is actually the that- only one. If that it, could well be a, a good going in the below the room shop. Yeah, no, it's uh, <laughs> it was a cheeky little piece that I um, thought of during the Space Jam frenzy. But as it's awesome. uh, as with most of my ideas, they only come into fruition a year after the event. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of what we're going to talk about, isn't it? Really, because we, I'm fairly sure there's people in our boat. Uh, somewhere along the line as well, but we have we have plenty of ideas, don't we? And then uh, life sort of gets in the way. This is it. It's like I am the master <laughs> of coming up with these world changing ideas. It's that old thing of yeah, yeah. I've got a I've got this really good invention or idea written on the back of a fag <laughs> packet, and then ten years later, somebody becomes a millionaire doing that exact <laughs> thing that you had been <laughs> laughed out of the room with. Do you know what I mean? It happened recently. It both did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me, me, and a, a buddy. Of mine, in fact, I suppose now the idea is gone. I can divulge it, but yeah, me and my buddy Mark Ferris, who does a lot of photography, the basketball. Mm-hmm. We had this thing about two years ago, going, yeah, what we need to do is set up a thing at games and tournaments, um, especially for like kids basketball, where mm. he's taking top photographs of like action shots. And then uploading them onto his computer, banging them on a screen in the foyer, and parents can then have a look and oh, nice. buy photos, and we print them off there and then. And it's like, yeah, that's a fucking great idea. That went to yeah. Bellevue a couple of weeks ago. Someone set up doing exactly that. <sighs> it's like there goes another one. <laughs> <laughs> that might not be permanent. You should keep your eye on that. That might not be a permanent thing. That might only be temporary. Whoa. And then you can sweep in. Yeah. Yeah. Swoop right in. We're gonna we're gonna have plenty of basketball chat, I'm sure, as we go through this. But we'll we'll chat about other bits and bobs as well. Attaining to uh what we do kind of when we're not on the podcast, which is I mean, this is a very small percentage of uh of life for us, although we'd like, rather it was a more long term thing. It's a bit quiet in the BBL right now, isn't it? I mean, they've announced the uh, the new format, which I quite like. I don't, I don't dislike more league games and less cup games, if I'm honest. Yeah, I mean, it was funny. I was talking to someone about it yesterday, and it's like, oh, have you seen this? That the teams all play each other four times now. Home and away but, twice. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, nice. It did. It did used to be like that back in the day. They yeah. used to do f- home and away twice. Yeah. Um, but then the point I made after, because I've not read the article properly was yeah but that means that are we going to have it at the start of the season where everyone where you get sick of playing seeing the Giants playing Cheshire and then they play each other another four times Hmm. and then it's like you know I'm hoping not because it's not obviously the regional thing was related to the cup group stages Hmm. this should be the interesting thing I think is going to be how 
ready teams are because when the cup starts and let's not forget we have what a month of the cup yeah at least when the cup starts and it's the group stages no one's really ready no. they they maybe teams have bought in a couple of americans maybe maybe see teams have bought four in but there's there's one or two they're not sure of and they end up disappearing and teams will re-sign somebody else or someone like cheshire who bring players in fairly late they won't have two months grace if you like of the cup mm. it's season's going to be they're going to kind of hit the ground running I like it and I like that it takes away the like, I know people are saying that the head to heads are easier to work out when it's three games but within that you one team's going to have a home court advantage one team's playing at home twice mm. I just think with more games and with the extra so nobody's got any kind of home court advantage with more fixtures, it should hopefully help separate the pack a bit more, as it were. Yeah. And if it doesn't, let's have another game. Let's have a playoff. Let's have a play-in tournament. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If they announce when the season's going to start, I don't. I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't think so. Is it felt? And I know that teams are already trying to uh, get fixtures lists ready and together because obviously, well, those that don't have their own venues, obviously, yeah. I've got to do it ASAP, you know, to secure the time, as it were. Mm. But I'm not sure. It normally starts around the end of September, doesn't it? Pre-season, maybe the beginning of September. Teams yeah. coming back from Australia and the Canada Summer League and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like the more had happened by this time last year in terms of there was, like, some really quick signing announcements. and Well, we've had... There's been a couple... There's one I can't remember his name. Um, well, it was Cheshire actually announced. Was he a GB player? I think so. Yeah, or a former GB player or something. I can't remember what his name was. Um, it's been a bit like that, and it a bit uh, yeah lazy looking at stuff like that. And I know the Patriots are desperately trying to announce, but they're waiting to announce venue situation first, which Nicholson said the other week. Yeah. So I know they want to announce some, but it's yeah, it'd be interesting to see that that interview with Mark Stewart, didn't they as well, which didn't really give too much away. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's just it's, it's um, I'm excited to hear what happens down in Plymouth this year. It's uh, mm. I don't know if Nicholson's just blowing hot air, but everything that he, he was he was sort of implying a lot of exciting things last time we spoke. Mm. Well, they haven't stopped. You know, like, and I'm sure it's the same in other BBL teams, but they literally haven't stopped. Saying a lot, but saying nothing at all. Yeah, <laughs> that's a, that's a BBL trait, isn't it? That should be the, uh, <laughs> the, the slogan. The, slogan. <laughs> the BBL Say saying a lot, everything, but actually saying nothing at all. <laughs> uh, never mind. Right, my man. Let's. Uh, Let's go back, because I'm I'm interested to to know where you. Because I'm I'm assuming you you picked this game up. You started being involved with with basketball, BBL or or even NBL bef- before me. I don't know because we're the same age, aren't we? We are. Uh, Forty four. Hmm. Depressing, isn't it? Very. But, I'm laughing, but it's not funny. <laughs> it really isn't. It's like, God. I mean, I'm 44 in a couple of weeks' time, and it's that one in it where next year's 45. The next, Ugh, the next nearer to 50 than you know you're what? 30. The, I'm like that man. The next tick column on application <laughs> forms is 45 to 50. 50. <laughs> and it's like 50. But then it's I, not right. You know, it's not right. <laughs> oh God, what? What is life? Do you know what somebody, an old guy, and he wasn't that old, got on the bus today and called me uh, young man. Mm. And I was like, I'll take it. I'll take young man all day of the week. And he's like, oh, a young whippersnapper like you. I was like, I'm not far from 50, mate. That's it, isn't it? It's, mm. um, I don't know. I think it's like you look at, I always do it like this. I think about what did my dad look like when he... <laughs> 44 and then I go back through my head and work out what year yeah. that would have been and you're going 
I'm well cooler than my dad was at this. <laughs> See, I'm all right. My old man don't look 50 now, and he's in his 70s. Really? Oh, yeah, my granddad, my granddad made it to 90, nearly 95. He was 94, oh. and he didn't look a day over 70. Wow. See, my old man looks like he used to be in a band in the 70s. Was he? No. Never know with you no. and your band connections. No. We'll get to that. No. No, he, very, he hasn't got a musical bone in his body by his own admission, <laughs> but he's got sort of long prog rock hair. <coughs> oh, and nice. And a beard, and he wears those glasses that go to sunglasses when it gets sunny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, the flip-down ones, or actual no, polarised? actual ones. He looks like... Yeah. Um, very cool. Ozzy like, Osbourne? No, no he's more, he looks more like Jeff Lynne from ELO. <laughs> yeah. Or something like that. Where did you go to your first game then, man? I'd... It's hard it's to... that far back. Yeah. <clears throat> it's hard to remember because I'd... I do remember the first time I ever saw basketball in real life. Uh-huh. And it would have been... Well, it can only have been in two years. It can either have been in about 1987 or uh-huh. 1988 because... It was at Stratford Leisure Centre, and I used to have swimming lessons there, and my sister did as well. And while she was in her session, you know, like when you, your parents sit in, my parents used to sit and read a book while we were having yeah. lessons. I, yeah. I used to just go for a mooch around the leisure centre and watch the squash players and all that. And I remember seeing this little sign on the wall um, at the balcony that said, um, training session or something like training facility of Mm -hmm. Manchester United and Stratford Leisure Centre where it is you can actually see Old Trafford from it oh yeah yeah yeah. and I remember thinking why would Man United be training in the sports hall at Stratford Leisure Centre (laughs) and bear in mind (laughs) I'd have been like nine or ten at the time so I sort of Mm. opened the door and sheepishly wandered into the balcony and looked down and there was just all these massive dudes mm. playing this sport. And I remember thinking, these guys look cool. And I, I, I remember, it's weird what your memory spits out at you in it because oh, yeah. sometimes I can't remember what I was doing this morning. But yeah, I still have this picture in my head of seeing Jeff Jones running around with a basketball and probably, well, when you look at who was on that team, some of the greatest players ever. And I was just... Jeff Jones was playing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was was a player. And I just remember being mesmerised by it and thinking, this is cool. I like this. And it just, there was just something about it. Do you know what I mean? You know, when you just something gripped you. 100%. And back then it wasn't like you could you know, go and really do any research. And so on a Sunday, I'd always hope that they were in there training Mm. um, or having a game. And I didn't really know what I was watching. I just knew I liked it. And there was something really exciting about it. And and the dudes were huge. Um, But they were wearing sort of Man United type stuff. You know that, yeah, because it was it was wasn't it? It was a, it was the football. Well, they, it was basically the, the kit looked like the team, the football team kit with sharp electronics on it. But yes, like they just I remember they, that one. Like they just cut the sleeves off and turned them into mm. basketball vests. And in hindsight, when you look at pictures back, you know, on the internet now, they were really tight. I mean, geez, <laughs> I've seen Jeff wearing some budgie smugglers. <laughs> with some hairdos in these photographs but yeah I think that was it but for me when it really sort of gripped me would have been about 91 do you remember when it started creeping through over here and you could mm. get the odd bit of Chicago Bulls stuff and yes that's that's the first time yeah, I remember watching the Bulls in 91 and, and sort of you go in the odd sports shop and there'd be an Air Jordan display Mm-hmm. And people had the odd Jordan hat, um, and I remember becoming pretty aware of Michael Jordan. Um, yeah. And then the Olympics happened, the '92 Olympics. Yeah. And no, I, I definitely remember that, that. That was the that was the kind of clincher 
You know what I mean? I've been to a few games, like Giants games, in their various guises. But mm. the first time the NBA really caught and on for me would have been about then. Well, what about that you? you well. So were you, did you follow, you, you were Brit- British basketball first? Well, I wasn't, it, it, it was just, wasn't really, I can't really remember what was the sort of clincher in terms of I was obsessed and going to games all the time. Mm. Um, I'd certainly probably have gone to a British game before ever watching an NBA game on TV because yeah. it just wasn't on TV. It wasn't. Uh, no, yeah, I right. think it was for a while. You'd see it on the... Um, re- well, Alton Bird bought it in Yeah, early, yeah. early 90s. Do you remember yeah. a TV show called... What was it now? It was something like Anglo-American Sports or something. Or it was this weird sports show uh, that was... Transworld on, Sport. Transworld Sport. Yeah, yeah, mate. And, yeah. and it'd have the odd feature on yep. NBA. It uh, sometimes had Euro, uh, Euro yeah, yeah, yeah. as well on there. Um, so I'd always record that. Uh, yeah. It was on at like, some really weird time. Yeah. Uh, and I'd watch it with my dad. Channel 4. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I remember if there was a basketball segment, um, I'd just watch it over and over again. Mm. Uh, Did you ever watch... See, I used to watch it on Grandstand on a Sunday. There was always basketball do, on Grandstand. Do you remember Grandstand? I mean, how good was Grandstand? Grandstand was awesome. It, what, it had everything. What time did it start? It was like 12 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, or 11 o'clock in the morning, but it was on all afternoon. It was on a Saturday. Till, till, like, till like 5 o'clock. Well, I remember Sunday Grandstand had the basketball on it. Yeah, but even Saturday Grandstand. that, was, that Grandstand. seemed to be all afternoon on BBC Two. Yeah, yeah. Because on, on Saturday Grandstand, it was always like, the first bit was boring because it was horse racing. It was always horse racing, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then it would yeah. be something, it, you know, vaguely the occasional greyhound race. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then it'd be something like, um, it'd be golf. Or something like that. A bit of darts, yeah, darts. all sorts of shite. Yeah, and yeah. And basketball. Yeah. yeah, and basketball. So I'm pretty sure I'd have zeroed in on it there. But you you were saying there that 91 for you and the Bulls. That was the Bulls, yeah. That's when I, I like what, cl- first... How did you clock onto it, though? Well, bef- it, it would have been through the Bears. See, I was the same as you, about 80, must have been 88, 89 season. So they weren't in the BBO yet. And a mate, uh, dad's mate at work said to, that he should take me along to Worthing Bears. I was swimming. I was a swimmer at the time. Yeah. And I was swimming at uh, I was swimming in Sh- at Shivers, which is in like Hove. And um, mum and dad got me into swimming because I was asthmatic. <laughs> well, like, weirdly, uh, well, like below listeners <coughs> don't know is that pubs used to do synchronised swimming. No, I. <laughs> you know where you're on your back and poking your leg up through the water. And... None of that. Nearly, I'd, I've scored with my foot before in water polo. Though. I volleyed it in. Yeah. Uh, anyway, and uh, he said, "Yeah, he said, take your lad along to watch Worthy and Bears. He'll love it." And I did straight. Mum and Dad didn't like it to start with. Right. And my old man was used to going to the football. He used to take me to Brighton. We used to go and watch Brighton, and I used to stand on a tomato box in the north stand. See, this is what um, confuses me about you because you'll then drop in that you're actually from London. Well, my dad's—he's Plumstead originally. My dad. So, did you grow up in? And we've got a London lot of family. Or Brighton. In, I grew up in Brighton, but we spent a lot of time in London because aunties and uncles and cousins and grandparents were always. But you never lived. Well, in my London. grandparents were. In, my grandparents moved back to Brighton, so. But I've, I never lived in London. No, I spent a lot of time there. I played water polo in London and right. swam in London. And uh, as I said, relatives and stuff there. So he spent, a, and I was, I'm a Charlton supporter, football wise, not so much. Well, yeah. I follow it a bit. I, I, I look out for the scores, but it used to be a bit more. F- I had a season ticket. Yeah. But we started off going to Brighton, going to watch. Dad used to take me down to watch Brighton. And then, uh, like I said, his mate from work said, take him along to the basketball. So we went, and I loved it straight away. Yeah. And that would have been just before. So I think I got a program. I think, I think. I'm not sure. Well, I've got a series of programs with like Hemel. We played, seem to play Hemel hundreds of times in a season. Yeah. Um. So I've got a few of them. But yeah, we, we st- and then first eighty nine ninety first season in the BBL, we went. We just went every week. We just we went uh, on my birthday, I think, and then never never really looked back. Just just went every week. And um, from that, my dad used to get the. Um, we used to get a program, so there'd be loads of stuff in the program. Um, 
about stuff coming up on TV and and NBA fixtures as would be in there as not fixtures or some there'd be some chat about it. But he used to get the uh, there's like a little fanzine, right? I think it was called the Paw Print, right. like a Worthing Bears fanzine site type thing, and that had stuff in it as well. And he would uh, he'd then look it up. I'm guessing on CFAX. I don't know. Might have been uh, yeah, teletext because you could actually might have been on teletext. If you could look, at, he'd look it up. Yeah. and you see the game start, and then there'd either be because we've I've got a V. I don't know if I've still got that a VHS somewhere of highlights from the '91 Bulls final against the Lakers. Yeah, yeah. But it was only highlights, and it wasn't very long. Yeah, yeah. But he also taped a couple of games from the Portland s- series the season after. Yeah, so yeah, that would yeah. Have been the, you yeah. know, the '91, '92. Yeah. But I was a I was a Bears fan before, before Chicago, but Chicago was all you could see because they'd only ever put the finals on, and it was Chicago in the finals from. Well, that was it. The next three years, wasn't it? I mean, in a lot of ways, we were fucking lucky to have got into it, and we did because. Oh, good. Gotcha. You know, the first time we were watching NBA finals, we were watching Jordan versus Magic, mm. and you know, it was almost like the prequel to the Dream Team. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, all the elements are there. By the, yeah. by the time the Dream Team came around, you know, I didn't necessarily know all the superstar players, but mm. I knew who Michael Jordan was, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, the obvious one. Charles, yeah. I knew who Pippin was because obviously he played for the Bulls. I knew who yeah. Charles Barkley was because I remember once on that program we mentioned before, they'd done a, a piece on the Phoenix Suns mm-hmm. um, for some reason. And there was a feature on Charles Barkley when he just signed to, to Phoenix because pre-Olympics, that was his last season in Philadelphia. And right. when he came back, it was Phoenix Suns. So mm. Around that time, I'd become aware of Charles Barkley as well. He was MVP that 92-93 season, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um, but the other player that I remember, and it's this is a weird one, I, re- I knew Patrick Ewing was, but not. Yes. Because of him being a player, but because oh, really? there was, no, there was a kid at our school that was into basketball and he had some Ewing trainers. Oh, um, mate, I like them. Yeah, and uh, everyone was like, Ewing? What, what's, what's that? He was like, Patrick. 33 what, Ewing, yeah. Patrick Ewing. They were like uh, New York Nick Blue. With blue, orange, blue yeah, orange yeah. and white. And yeah. they were pretty cool. They were typically 90s, massive. Do you, do you remember the tags? Tags. The little, t- like the little uh, plastic emblem. So Ewan's one was was a was a round was a orange basketball with thirty three and Ewan on it. Was it? And it's on one of those little chains that linked oh, to the. Oh, okay. Me and my mates used to go into. Well, it wasn't JD Sports then. It would have been Intersport probably. Yeah, the nicking. Used to go into Intersport and things and just, yeah, just take yeah. them off the shoes. Yeah. Yeah, I'd loads. I'd loads. I had Tarmax ones. Right. That was Larry Johnson. That was, wasn't it? Tarmax yeah, yeah. later on. I remember the first time but I... But the Ewing one was awesome because it was a ball. Yeah, yeah. It was an actual ball. Like yeah. a key ring. I remember the first yeah, time really cool. I, um, I ever saw a pair of Air Jordans in real life. Uh-huh. Um, and some other kid at our school um, had just got a pair of Jordan 6s. And you know, oh, and you, they're my favourite. And, and you know, at school when like something like that happens, it's like mm. wildfire. It's like, oh, yeah. so and so's got some Jordan sixes, <laughs> and you, so I'm like, oh yeah, nice one. What? You know what I mean? And yeah. I saw it, and I was just looking at them, going, they are, they are so cool. They're the ones with the toggles. Oh, I've got a pair, and oh. they've they've got the toggle. And it's it's mad, isn't it? Because you just said it about those little chain things. I, mm. I always wanted to have them little toggle things, yep. the laces. You can get them on eBay now. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's mad, isn't it? And yeah. um, I remember um, he also he came in and he had this postcard that he got with him, and it was a picture. Oh, yeah. It was like a, you know the original Jordan pose, but a real, yeah. real photograph. And he's in like what looks like an old high school gym. It's like a really classic picture yes. and I, he does it left handed yeah 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 and we which were, I always found weird we were just looking at it just going this is the, wow you know yeah. and it, and it's like you, I remember the first kid that got Reebok pump it was oh, like, everyone pumping up their shoes well, and letting them, I, I, letting I, out, I, yeah. just, I just remember this kid in PE putting them on and we were like what are them and he's like They're huge as well yeah they? yeah and he's like watch this and he pumped them up and we were like what's that doing he's like feel this bit here and then, <laughs> then press that, and you hear them go, tss, tss, 
<laughs> and in hindsight, it's it was un- It was like, are you serious? That is amazing. But it was actually the crappiest bit of technology. Yeah, I was, it didn't, yeah, didn't, it, do, it didn't anything. do anything. No, it just, just tightened around your foot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, if in hindsight, it's like when you have your pulse taken. You know what I mean? You yeah. feel it yeah. filling yeah. up. Right? It's it. like, wow. <laughs> What what does this do? But like when you're a kid, gimmicks like that are just oh, it's, it's everything. And it's just like that was a hell of, hell of a marketing thing because they did it for tennis as well. They had a tennis shoe with a little tennis ball. Yes, and it, you could pump up the the, the yellow tennis ball, and then obviously Shaq Shaq wore them, didn't he? Yeah, Later his on. his first ones were pumps, weren't they? But then I remember another kid sort of getting laughed at because it was like you know trainers were everything, wasn't it? It's like it is now, yeah. I guess. But when you're sort of fourteen word gets out that someone's got a pair of Reebok pump and I was never mm. in that game because my mum and dad would have never spent 150 quid in 1991 no. on a pair of trainers for me I, we used to I had a limit of 30 quid when I needed yep. new trainers and you're just looking desperately for something that looks half decent my first pair of basketball boots would you remember the brand Arrow yeah I do yeah and they made football boots. Yeah, they as did, well, yeah. but they did. That. I found this pair of basketball boots in a little sports shop that was nineteen ninety nine, and they were massive. They were like moon boots, and and the tongue looked like a fucking shin pad. It was that, big. <laughs> and also it had two sets of laces in them, a black pair and a white pair. Oh, that's all you need. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it was just like yeah, yeah. But, That's but, genius. but no one really sort of was like, oh yeah, Adam Adam Masters, he's got a pair of arrows with two sets of laces. No. And it's like, well, yeah. but yeah, this one kid once came in and he's like, yeah, yeah, we'll check out what I've got. And he had the Puma disc. Do you remember them? Oh yeah, the t- you turn the disc to yeah. tighten your shoe. And everyone just went, that shit. That's mad. They were. Yeah. They never lasted. Yeah, did they? that was a that was another. It's like a wire, and it broke. It always broke. Yeah, it always snapped. It was like nylon. And then your shoe just fell off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was like, nah, they ain't cool. But the the Jordan Six was just like that was that was it, a, that was elite. It was like it still is. I love the Jordan oh, Six. It's just what's your got what one question I noted down for you was what's your all time favorite basketball shoe? That's it. The six Jordan Six in black. In black, the infrared. The the black and uh, black and red. But it's more like an orange, isn't it? It's like black and orange almost. It's such a bright red. Yeah, yeah. Well, they call it the infrared, don't they? Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. it. That's it for me. I only got my first pair of them about six months ago. Um, I'm going to get some one day. Yeah, I found some. The guy was selling a pair. Um, what I'm really pissed off about is, you know, the plastic thing that you use to pull them on? Yes. I, I snapped it, and I need to figure oh. out a way of gluing it back on, but I was gutted. It was the first time I was wearing them out, putting them on. Snap. Absolutely dead. You must be able to replace it. Yeah. Or, but, yeah, like you say, glue but it. But they're, like, stitched on, so it's like... No one, right? You gotta have some special sort of sewing machine to fucking get that on. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah. it's weird because in, in China or Thailand, probably. Yeah, Because yeah. <laughs> I, I'm with you. The six is a work of art. It mm. just a stunning shoe. My favourite, though, purely for nostalgia, is the seven. Because is that the grey one? Well, the seven they did them in grey, white, and grey and purple and black. all different colours. Well, I, I had the, my first pair of proper. What I considered to be expensive shoes was the Jordan 7 Bordeaux, which is the grey ones. Mm-hmm. Um, and he wore them in the All-Star game. He only wore them once. But the only reason that I got them was because I remember I was walking through Old Stream with my mum, which is which the town I grew up in in South Manchester. Yeah, yeah. Sports shop that, that always had a rack outside of what was on sale. And I clocked these Jordans uh, and they were reduced <laughs> to £45. Um, wow! Because they weren't. I don't think that colour was a massive hit at the time. They've reissued. It was. It wasn't here. But it was in the states. Yeah, yeah. It? And now, the one he wore in the didn't he wear it in the Olympics or something? No, yeah. they did, he did a white one for the Olympics. Oh, right. Got a pair of them as well. And um, <laughs> and I went over and I was like, Mum, they, these are the ones. The forty-five pounds. And I expected her to go. Yes, well, your limit's thirty. And she just went because I've been banging on about getting Jordans for, for ages at this point. And she went, yeah. well, let's go and see if you've got your size. And for me, that was it. It was like, I'm in. I am in. And uh, we asked for my size, which was an eight. I've still got these shoes. They're in pieces. And um, <laughs> he come out with the box. You know, when you have that nervousness while you're waiting for them to come out and they go, no, nah, yeah. I've not got that size. And he had him. And I tried them on. And my mum was like, um, 
do you really like those ones? And I was like, oh, yeah. She's like, right, yeah. I'll pay 30 and you can put in £15. Pounds. And you know what, Pabs? I'd have fucking delivered newspapers for the rest of my life. <laughs> Which is what other the, the little job I had at the time delivering the yeah. paper. So I remember getting home to my jar and getting out fifteen pound coins and going, "There you go." And it was like, you never want to awesome. pay your parents back, but just to get him. And the, I kept the box. I had the box on display in my room. Oh mate, I've never thrown a Jordan box away. Oh, <laughs> they're they're in the loft. I don't they're know over, where they're sprinkled went. around the house. I just there's things like that. Even the paper, even the little even paper, the paper with the twenty threes all yeah, over. Yeah, there's things like that though. Where still got them. I'm like, at what point in my life did I just go? Oh, I'll shut this box away now because I'm just not that person. I keep everything. <laughs> I went through a phase of having to sell everything because I was skin. But oh, we've all been. There. You know, it's yeah. that one where uh, you can't really. Well, I guess you can, but I've never thought. Oh, I'll sell the shoe box. But at some point, I must have just. Chucked it out. Yeah, but, used for storage probably. But that, that, I do, I do do that. I'm just looking around the garage now to see if I can see. There's one in here somewhere. Yeah. So is that it's your? Probably just got old remotes in it. But. Was that your first pair then? The six? Did you Did you get? It? No, I've never had a pair. Oh, you I've never, never had, had a pair of six. No, my first pair was a pair of um, blue. They were special edition blue Nike Air Flight. And I got them for mum. Mum and dad got them for Christmas for me. Right. And that must have been that must have been eighty nine. Right. Yeah, eighty nine, ninety maybe. But they were been proper moon boot territory. Oh, they were they they weren't as big as like the Converse because the, the all the guys playing were wearing those massive Converse, mm. which you can get. I'm tempted to get a pair. I can't remember what the number of them is. It's like a SBX something or other or something. I can't remember. Right. But all the players seem to wear, especially at the Bears. Yeah. Because the kit the kits were Converse. Yeah, yeah, that's and they right. all had these massive Converse shoes, and I can Colin Irish particularly had them on, and so did Steve Nelson as well. But obviously, that was that's ninety two. That's because that's the first two seasons. Obviously, those guys weren't at Worthing. We had Dale Shackelford. Well, who was the first player that you connected with? Like when you went to the, your first Brighton game, my there's my was first a player that you just go, I like him, Ronnie Baker. Was it Ronnie Baker? Yeah, 1989. Wow. Ronnie, Ronnie's first. Well, I don't. Know if, I don't. Know if he, I can't remember if he played NBL before. If we got him in just for the BBL. Ronnie started off at the first two. Brixton, cool. didn't he? Yeah, but he was a top coach. Yeah, yeah. One of uh, one of Jimmy Rogers' boys, but he um, he was phenomenal. He was so fast, like ridiculously fast. He was Ronnie Baker, and I didn't cut on onto it until he came to Giants in the mid nineties. He was always the one that all the kids liked. Yeah. It was like yeah. every kid at the arena was Ronnie Bakered up. You know what I mean? That's amazing. And you got to think, some of the players that were on the teams he played with, you're talking of like the Dorseys and the Church. I was going to say, and John, John White. White and, and, yeah. You know, some truly great MVPs. players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the, the Phil Hander year. You know what I mean? But oh, wow. Ronnie was the captain. And he was by far the most popular player. And I wonder if it's because he was a lot smaller. Because when I he think, played for I Giants, think a part of that, when, he, when he played for Giants, he had the cool dreadlocks. And he, he went through this phase of wearing yeah. his socks all the way up to his knee. Yeah. But because the shorts were so long, it was like. He almost met. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, he wasn't. He did that at Bright when he came back to Brighton in the early would have been early two thousands. I think he did the same then. Because how tall was he? Like five eight something like that. Well, he was list. He was listed same height as Alton, but that was generous, I think. Because I remember, um, you know, meeting him several times, and, and he was sort of same height as me, and I'm sort of. You see the top of his head. I yeah. was about five eight, five nine. In those days, they were about that height. Yeah, no, no doubt. Um, no doubt. But the way he, he so far, the way so. he just ran around defenders and was so quick, he was just like the kids. He was just that guy, wasn't he? Mm. Oh god, yeah, yeah. I, it's weird, isn't it? Because, like you say, you looking back, I, I can't. Alan Cunningham's just generationally awesome. It's like he's he's, and when I look back at old games and things, he's just one of my if not my favourite player ever. Yeah. But when I think back and look back at the time, and even to the extent of looking back at passwords I used for email addresses and things like that, 
It was Ronnie Baker. And I love Alan Cunningham. And then it was no, nah, then it was uh, it was it after and then it, I, I really liked Gary Chicken Smith. Mm. He didn't play a lot, but when he played, he was he was really good. He ended up coaching Worthing Thunder. I, he, I think he started the franchise there. Yeah. And now he's Sussex Bears. Yeah. Well, I like Gary, but Colin Irish. He was the MVP and he was really popular. But later on, I guess Steve Nelson yeah. transcended a bit, and Cleve Lewis. They they kind of stuck around when the club was very crap. Yeah. But then we picked up Mike Brown. At downtown Mike Brown was my favourite player for like a five year stretch while he was at the Bears, regardless of who came in and out. Because we still had Mike Brown, and I just I thought he was awesome. He I remember Mike Brown because he played his first pro season here. He did. That's his choice. Um, yeah. And if I remember rightly, he was out of Providence University. Yeah, which is one of the, right. which is a big hitter in D one, and yeah, I, I remember him vividly. Being, He's a great shooter, yeah, great defender as well. Yeah, he was. Um, that wasn't a very successful Giants year. That they didn't really do anything that year. But he was, he, he was a sick player because I seem to remember him leaving and being gutted, and he went to Milton Keynes. D- did he go to Milton Keynes? Yeah, I, I, I think he went to Milton Keynes after that, and then ended up. See, I know he, he came to us, and we were we were not good. No, and he was by far the best player we had. And I think I liked him so much because he 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 stuck around for the for the couple of I might have been two or three seasons I think at least two seasons where we were very very bad I think Mark Dunning was the coach and he just did the best he could but yeah. the recruits would come in and they weren't up to much. we had Kevin Wallace one year who was who was decent but he stuck around Mike Brown stuck around and and then of course Nick Nurse came in yeah. And then we end up with with Randy Duck running the point, downtown Mike Brown playing shooting guard and spot up shooting and just defending. And then Sterling Davis, who was really good as well. We had Albert White for a season. Who, I mean, I still don't know how we ended up getting him. And I, to this day, he's one of, if not the best player I've seen live. Yeah. In the BBL, he was. Um, I can't describe just how good he was. He was unreal. Who, well, go on. I'm, I'm interested. Who was your? Who was the guy you first? Well, thought. Wow, that dude's it, it, my favourite player. To say that I started going to every game, it would have probably been around '92, and they played mm-hmm. at a sports centre called the Armitage Centre in Fallowfield, and it wasn't massive. Uh, it had bleachers at one side, and opposite there was a balcony looking down at the court where Mike Shaft had DJ. And I remember one of the first things I thought was, how oh, cool is that dude up there going, oh, baby. Recording in progress. He, 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 he'd have like these same tunes that he'd always, when the team were warming up and just before tip-off, he'd always play two unlimited songs. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it would either be, you're ready for this? Or yeah. um, oh, I'll never think, whenever I hear it now, which isn't very often, obviously, um, whenever you hear him, um, all I think of is the Giants warming up at the Armitage <laughs> Centre and Mike Shaft going, the big game in town tonight. <laughs> um, but the first player I remember going, oh, yeah, was a, a guy called Leo Rogers. I don't know if you Oh, that. mate, uh, yes, yeah. the dunk king. Yeah, Leo, because in the warm-ups, he was doing dunks that were just like, he was out of the roof. We had him at the Bears. Yeah, and it was like, this dude is awesome. So Leo Rogers, he was very good. I think Leo Rogers made it onto my school book of you know where you write things like Leo can fly. Jimmy Rogers' son, of course. Right. Um, so yeah, it was him, and um, who else was there? There was a. There was a. I mean, this is game. This is. Can I? Can I tell you before you get to say the other guy? Can I just tell you something about how weird this is? You saying like writing Leo Rogers can fly on a on your notebook or whatever. Yeah, yeah. In uh, year seven, must have been year seven. We did design technology with Mister Pigeon, and we had to make a clock. Do you remember you get the thick plastic and the buffing machines? Oh yeah. And you cut out the shape you want. Oh yeah. I yeah. made a clock, right? I made a blue, a round blue clock. 
buff it, buff the edges of it, which had a leather inlay, which I then like drew the basketball lines on it. I had the Air Jordan logo right. that I also put on it, and I was going to write Air Jordan across the top, and I wrote Leo Rogers. No, <laughs> and that was on my wall forever. Fuck. And it said Leo Rogers. I wonder if we could track Leo <laughs> Rogers down. Because this is the mad thing in it about when you're doing stuff like this. You know, you're just chatting away with your mates. And, you know, so Leo Rogers is sat somewhere now on a Friday night, kicking back, doing whatever you oh. do. And it, it little does he know that there's two dudes, one in Manchester and one in the fucking Cornwall, lower end but, yeah. of the country, yeah. fanboying him. It's Amazing. Talking about him, I'm sure he won the dunk contest. It must have been eighty nine. It must have been nineteen well, ninety. I'll tell you something. And right. he won it. With, I'm sure he won it with the free throw line dunk. Much like the missing Jordan boxes, I have a missing box of memorabilia because when I was a kid, I kept everything, you know, anything to do with basketball. And I remember putting them in those poly pockets. I had like letters inviting you to camps. And oh, the slippery fish things, yeah, 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 just just anything to do with the basketball. I had in this folder, and I wrote to the BBL, whatever season that was, asking why he'd not been selected for the All Star game. Oh, and they wrote me a letter back saying, oh, shit. We understand, you wouldn't get that now. No, you un- we, it said something like, We understand that Leo is very well respected, and we really hope he'll be in the slam dunk contest. And then I think he went down and he won the slam because the only guy from the Giants that and that, funnily enough, that All Star game is on BBL Player. No, yeah, you know, oh, that's the one. You know, if you go to classic games, yes, yeah, it's, yeah, it's there that's up there because it was on TV. Uh, is the dunk contest on I, it? Then? No, it's just the game. It was at Granby Halls in Leicester, and the only Giants player that was there was Danny Craven. Ah, uh, he was good. Yeah. Um, he was there, and uh, I mean, there was plenty of players that played for Giants at some mm. point in it, but yeah. But I'll tell you the other thing I remember, did they do this at Brighton? There was a merchandise table at the Giants, and it literally was mm-hmm. just a pop-up table, and there was this yep. dude there, and every week, he'd come in with a big hold all um, full of VHS tapes, full of video tapes, which sounds proper <laughs> dodge when you think about it now, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, what's in your bag, mate? Video tapes. And he put them all out on the table, and he basically would record everything off Sky. He'd, no. he'd write the game that was on there, and he did this mad thing where you bought the tape off him for ten pounds, hmm. and then the next week, if you wanted to return it, he gave you a fiver back or something, and then and you could buy another one. Yeah, and he bought another one, and it was pre. Do you remember Pontel? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was this guy was just recording stuff off Sky. So you'd be looking Jeez. through all the game and unless you were like there mithering him as he was getting them out of his bag, because everyone wanted the Bulls games. Yeah. Um yeah, and you'd I remember ending up just because I needed to have one, I remember ending up with some absolutely dreadful nothingy game between like the Cleveland Cavaliers of the 90s versus the Miami Heat of the 90s. Just, you know, (laughs) just some complete nothing game. Just so you had a game. Just so you had a game. But then he'd always put, like, the the weekly magazine show at the end of the game as well, so you could watch, like... Oh, wicked. uh, Yeah. Um, But did they do that down there? Like, have they? Not that I remember. But then we used to... We used to stand... There was a a corner... This is at Worthing. There was a corner entrance where the players used to come in for warm-ups and whatnot. And me and just loads of kids would stand around there. We'd, I had a, we all had balls and there was no basket to shoot on, but there was like a like a panel in the wall and you would try and hit the panel in the wall right. with a, with a sh- sad. And then we used just to dribble around, dribble around. And, yeah. and then the guy would come over and tell us all to sit down. So we didn't really go near the merch. There was a merch table. Yeah. We never really went near it. But you saying about... Um, the two unlimited stuff reminding you of the Bears. I can't hear. There's three tracks, really. I can't. Li- it just makes me go weird. Like I just go into the zone. If I hear Jump, first of all, Van Halen. That was a big PBL. That, that was always yeah, in the yeah. build up. But they used to then. 
And they don't seem to do... Oh, do they do it now? No, they don't seem to do it anymore, I don't think. Just trying to think other two... Mind you, actually, I think they do at the... At, um, when they first... When the teams are obviously warming up, and then they disappear. Yeah. And then they announce them, and they come out in their full warm-up strips, and they do layup lines. Yeah. Bears used to do that, and they used to... Uh, this is at Worthing Leisure Centre. They used to do the Superman theme. Really? Yeah, they would announce the team with the Superman theme, and it's. It, I know it sounds cheesy. It was the coolest thing ever. I they get would it. come out. No, I get it. I and get they'd it. be in the layout lines. They were wearing the blue as well, so it was like Superman blue almost. It was a really yeah. strong blue back in those days. I get it. And the the third track is the player intros was done to um, Space Odyssey, two thousand or whatever it is, two thousand and one Space Odyssey. David Bowie. No, no, the the, uh, oh, the actual the film. The film. Wow. With the big kettle drums. Yeah, that, yeah, that, I can't yeah, hear that. Yeah. 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 Hairs. You're doing that now, aren't Hairs are going wow. up on my arm. In that Mate, map. it was insane. Right. Basketball so, jump was always one that they used to play in the arena days at the 9X yeah. arena. The other song that when I hear it, it's just, it, nothing else comes into my head other than Giants warming up is... Um, Beanie Man. Zim Zimmer. <laughs> Who got the keys to my Bima? Who am I? They always used to have that on in the layup line. And the other one is, wow, right. I can hear the song and I can't remember it's, who it's by. It's, um, oh, you're moving too fast. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know the one. Um, yeah. that, oh. They've remixed that about a thousand yeah, times. But I know the one that you mean. One. Yeah, yeah. And then when I hear them, I just go into this world of. You do you glaze over, it, yeah. but that's music. You know, they say is is one of the the most it it, it, it hits your senses. Oh, mate, they it, use it like, for like dementia like, and stuff. Don't yeah, they? yeah, yeah. Because there's there's, there's there's songs that I get it, hundred percent. Because it does it, and you think yeah. of one thing and nothing else. It transports you there. Yeah. I can smell the the smell. It's weird. Yeah. That's it. Like the smell of the old Mate, gym. I tell you what. That old do you remember when I was? Remember when I was doing those retro Giants jerseys? Yes. Right. So when they, well, to. I know, What's I know right? you have. Even though they get washed, right? <laughs> when I first got my hands on them and opened the bag and smelt them, it was like going back in time because the, amazing, the smell right? of those jerseys, it was like, wow, this is. I am back in nineteen ninety six with this smell, you know what I mean? And, yeah, and it's, a, yeah, it's yeah. a really weird, um, I don't know if it's the fabric or something, but even after you wash them, they've still got that smell. It's the it. dust. It's the, I don't know if it's the dust. Or nah, it's something in the fabric with these, because it's not like a, Is it? you know, it's like a sort of chemically smell, I guess, but it's like, Just smell, your back. yeah, so it's that whole thing in it. it. You know, for us, a lot of our musical memories will have been hearing them at basketball games and best the best thing for me I don't know about you if you've looked back at things I know you have actually because you you you're in the crowd for the oh yeah for the famous uh league decider yeah. we get Sheffield and that but that was a real kick for me going back and it was that's an I think that's 89 90 season going back and seeing me my dad and my mate Dickie yeah in the crowd of of Brighton, uh, Worthing Bears, sorry, Worthing Bears versus Thames Valley Tigers. It's that sort of. And I found another one the other day. I found one. It's a bit later on. It's when we had Daryl Reshaw. Oh, Christ knows how we got him because the guy's a like a European legend. There's one um, that I was watching, and I'm in the crowd with my mates. There was a game I was watching somewhere. It might have been on YouTube, where Jeff was doing punditry for a while for Sky. So mm. him and Kevin Cadle would be in a little box whenever it was at Manchester at the end of the court. And there's you, you can see these two kids running around at the bottom, of, you know, like beyond the glass. Yeah. And it's, it's <laughs> Callum and James Jones. Oh, no it's, way. it's like uh, 10 year olds. <laughs> I keep meaning to find it and send screens. That's great. Callum. Um, but they're just like that. And the reason that I clocked him is because I recognise Frida, their mum. That's amazing. I'm like, Hang on, that's free. That must be Callum and James. And then you know when you sort of look hard, it's like that's Callum when he's like ten yeah. years old. Because um, them two, even he, he's like, because I'm a bit older than them. I remember going to the odd camp that Jeff did, and them being there, being allowed to play, probably because they were Jeff's kids. And it yeah, was yeah. like them two are sick. 
And you know when you got you turn up to a to a scrimmage or something, and it's like Callum and James are here, and you'd be like, oh, oh shit, yeah, you know. I mean, ah. think about. I mean, I don't know how, how you had it, but I had it pretty rough up here because on any given Saturday morning at Trafford practice, Yorick could walk in just because yeah. he had nowhere to play, and he knew that there'd be a game to be had. He could scrimmage. And yeah. He'd turn up. Um, and sometimes joining our session just to prove how much better he was than everyone. <laughs> Dunk on you. But then he'd play in the men's session and we'd stay and watch. And even though and he, he still dominated. Even though he was yeah, because he he like when you're a kid, all you're bothered about is the fact that there's someone in front of you that you can dunk. And we'd Oh good we'd, yeah. we'd stay and watch for an hour. Even the coach sometimes let us play if they were short of numbers. Well, yeah. it was just like a men's open scrimmage, and Yorick could go just because he played. He did not stop playing basketball. You know, he, he literally he, he knew where everyone's practice was, and he'd turn up just to play. You know what I mean? And, and he was that good. And he was he? that good. And we used to just sit there at the side watching, just going, "Go on, dunk, dunk, dunk!" And any time that he got the ball on a steal, and it was just him in the basket, you knew he was going to do it. It was that anticipation yeah. if if Yorick was going to dunk and. He could fly as well. And he could fly. Um, and he was... <sighs> I remember the first time I ever saw Yorick, it was, um, I'd started going to Trafford and practising, and the guys used to go on about this mythical guy called Yorick. And um, it's like, oh yeah, Yorick was down the other night, and da 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 And I'd be like, ah, who's, <laughs> who's Yorick? Everyone got in, they were like, oh no, he's, he's sick, he plays for the Giants, cadets and all that, and he's this and he's that. And it was like, right, okay. And I remember the first time I saw him, he walked onto the court and he just looked cool. He had his like street clothes on. And mm. I don't know if it was the same down there, but the big fashion then was you wore like your tracks, your pants tucked into your socks. So you could see your, oh, uh, your, your whole... That never happened. Well, that was later down here. Yeah, it happened up here quite early on. And uh, he just looked cool. And then yeah. he, 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 he was taller he was very skinny back then he was quite wiry mm. and he just looked intimidating you know what I mean mm. and if he spoke to you you felt a bit of a buzz because it's like oh yeah yeah you know what I mean because we'd always yeah you're we, we, you know, we yeah. kind of kiss his ass a bit you know and, and he used to be really cool with me and a couple of mates because we'd go down early to Giants games to watch his games because uh, we wanted to yeah. watch him in a game um, so he'd always kind of let on. It's not like he'd be like, yeah, yeah, you're my mates, but he'd let on to you and be like, all right. Uh, yeah. But he still had that Yorick intensity and that look on his eyes like he was going to just destroy everything. Even awesome. even at the age of 15, 16. And, you know, whenever I see him now and we reminisce, he'll just, I'll tell him something that he once said or did. And he, well, he don't remember, but he'll say something like, "That's something I would have said when I was that age," and it was usually something highly offensive, like "Your shit" or "That hat you've got on shit," or you know what I mean. <laughs> but if he said something, I remember him once. I got a pair of Jordan Sevens in white, and he really liked him. And he came up, he's like, "Yeah, where'd you get them from? I like that. It's that sweet then." And I'd got them in America at an outlet mall. Hmm. And he was like, yeah, yeah, they're cool then. And he's thinking, oh, yeah, I'm sorted. Yorick thinks I've got cool kicks. You know what I mean? See, I, I think, I don't know what it was. Maybe it's because, like, all the kind of big hitters came in to Worthing and they were they were always kind of, they were elite and they were, like, out of reach, if you like. You couldn't, you wouldn't necessarily bump into him anywhere or you know well they were superstars Worthing yeah. Thames Valley and Guildford and I guess yeah, Kingston, Kingston. First, but yeah well they turned into Guildford they, they, they were the big hitters Giants were like a sort of... Kingston were unreal Kingston had like yeah uh, uh, what do you call it um, tabloid media going through their bins yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah. like that they were they were next level they were they were like conquering Europe, making the Elite Eight and all that kind of stuff. Because a mate I used but to... But we... I was... Oh, go on. I was going to say, a mate that um, had been going for longer than me to the game, 
I remember being in his dad's car and he was going on, oh yeah, Alton Bird will be in this game. And I'm going, mm. is he related to Larry Bird? And I, thought, well, I got confused. Yeah, They're in the same like, draft. Yeah. No. Um, and there's the obvious you know, reason why they're not related, you know what I mean? But yeah, one's tall. Yeah, one's tall, yeah. And, <laughs> and anyway, I remember um, after the game, would he, would he be, I remember after a game, you sort of followed your mates and they all rushed Alton Bird to get his autograph. So I did yeah. on a Giants yeah. programme. And I think it might have been, whether it was the same time, I don't know. I remember everyone swarming around Kevin St. Kitts. Oh, he was great. Yeah, because he didn't play for He was Giants. good at Thames Valley. Well, he yeah. must have been at Thames Valley at the time, but everyone was getting his autograph, so I thought, I'll better yeah. get this dude's autograph. And he, 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 Him and Mike Obaseki. Yeah, and Obaseki, and, and yeah. obviously St. Kitts did sort of flip. And Lester James, if he was there. Lester yeah, James yeah. was their best player. Well, Nigel Lloyd, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, and St. Kitts flirted with Manchester a few times. He, he, was, he did, yeah. played for him a few times over the years. But, you know, it was like, all oh, right, yeah. Terrell Myers remembers him very well. Yeah, yeah. Um, St. Kevin, yeah. Jeez, <laughs> flailing through the air. God. Listen, I was lucky. I, I didn't, we never got to train with, I mean, my, I was always swimming. Um, I don't think I'd even started playing water polo at that stage. I think I played, I, mum and dad got me into a basketball, uh, a weekly session at the King Alfred, which is also where I swam. It was quite a big complex, and my f- and I just remember being in so much awe. My first basketball coach was Dale Shackelford. Wow! But we're all in there. Like it's my first session, so I'm a bit nervous. I've uh, you know I've messed around and played a bit at home, you know, or in the garden or whatever. But never there weren't any outdoor courts. Not at this stage. Not not re- not that I can remember. Um. And Dale Shackelford, and obviously at this stage I'm going to the Bears yeah, yeah. pretty much every week with my dad, and uh, Dale Shackelford, and, and Gary Smith, Gary Chicken Smith walk in, right. and I just yeah. stood there staring, Yeah, I didn't. I don't think I spoke it's mad, isn't it? for ages. And then yeah. you concentrate concentrating that much on not messing up, you mess up. I don't even think I moved. I just stood there staring. See, I remember. Um, I didn't. Ju- I just. I couldn't believe it. They, they're like, I've just got their autographs on a ball. Right. Like, yeah. And it's yeah, like, yeah. And now they're co- yeah, yeah. too much. I mean, I remember the first ever camp I went to one of Jeff's camps because at that point, Jeff was the main man. He was the head coach of the Giants. Mm. He was Jeff Jones, the legendary player. And if you went to one mm. of Jeff's camps, it was like, oh, right. Yeah. And he'd have a couple of players come in to show you stuff and, and coach it. And I remember one of the first drills he did was he had us all in a circle and he was doing that thing, you know, where you sort of crouch down and you pass the ball to yourself through your legs, just back and forth. Yeah. And I, yeah, I remember yeah. pushing it back through my legs and at the ball, I missed it with my other hand and it went right into the middle of the circle and you had that walk of shame in the middle. To go <laughs> it, you know what I mean? And it's like, oh, this is horrible. This is horrible. You know, you've done it a million times, but like you screw it up in front of everyone else, and Jeff's there in the middle, and it's like, yeah, he thinks I'm shit. one of your heroes. Is watching. well, it's that one for us. It was like, you know, you you thought you were in with a sniff of maybe getting into the Giants cadets or something, and it was like, that's it, screwed it up. Done. Yeah, that's it's done. Over. See, we, I didn't even realize it was an option. Like at that stage, I enjoyed play. I played. I did well when it was. For those for those two years playing that just once a week kind of thing. But you were, a ch- you, but, was, but you were like a water polo god. Well, I was a swimmer then. What was? Where uh, did water polo fit in? Well, I swam for shivers, which is for anybody who knows anything about swimming will have at least heard of shivers. It's the club that Karen Pickering came from, and a guy called Stephen Akers that both went to the. Um, I think what Olympics that would be now. Yeah. Seoul, probably. Seoul Olympics. Or maybe Barcelona. Maybe Barcelona. Yeah. But Karen Pickering went on afterwards and did even more. She was... I think she won Commonwealth gold. She won a world... She either won the world championships or came second. Um, and I I trained... I was in the lane... I mean, I was a lot younger than them. I was in the lane just next to them. I was a, I was a good swimmer. Um, but I hated... I hated swimming competitions. I hated galas. I used to get so I got I was bullied 
and I got I used to used to clock better times in training than I did at events. Yeah. Like I had a national I had nationals times up till the age of about 14 just in training. I could I could no problem. Do it in an event, I'd be throwing up, I'd be a right state. Yeah, yeah. And um my grandfather played water way <clears throat> not sure how true it is as as time progressed. I think it's true. Bless him, granddad up there somewhere. He played water polo when he was in the navy, but he played it off the side of a ship in the Med, in like uh, up in uh, Trincomalee, I think it was up near, up towards like Singapore, that kind of way. So, and he said they lowered two goals in off the side of a of the aircraft carrier that he was on in the Second World War. Uh, and he said there was a there, there was a sniper, <laughs> they had a sniper sat on the deck picking off sharks, is what he said. I mean, grandparents <laughs> are the best storytellers ever. Oh. It's it's legendary. But it's so that then, one where my... it's that cool of a story. We're going to say oh, it happened. It's awesome, yeah. Uh, and it, it was almost like I, I I'd started playing a bit of basketball. My hand-eye coordination was really good. I'm I I annoy a lot of people because I can play almost any sport. Like I, and I'm half decent at yeah, it yeah. almost straight away. Yeah. And we went to Worthing. I left Shivers and I went to Worthing because Worthing had a water polo team. Yeah. And um. I started just started playing there, and you, I didn't realize that when you first start playing, you don't realize the kind of levels that there are. So like you think, oh, this is great, this is it. And then I started playing really well for Worthing, and I got picked to play for the county. So I played for Sussex, and then you played for Sussex, and I think, oh, this is really good. This is like you know, this is this is kind of the best. And then oh, no way, you get picked to play for the district, you get picked to play for the south, in what effectively is the national championships, the nationals. Against the north, the northeast, the west, the Midlands, and all the all the all the guys your age in the country, and I did that five years in a row. I made the nationals even out of age group. I made it out of age group three times, and then got picked for England and picked for GB and and um. And how old are you? Played, how old are you? Oh, so first England was sixteen. Right. So I was under I was under under sixteens, and then played right through till I was 19 I'm still I played basketball recreationally when it got to 19 I started playing for Brighton Uni and actually I was doing I was playing well like um, and we had this guy come they did like an exchange student thing with Stanford and the, one of the guys from Stanford came down and he desperately wanted me to go to Stanford wow. to to because they have a good water polo team as oh, well really? I was. He wanted me to go. I didn't. I, to be honest, at that stage, we, we. I don't know if you're the same. I didn't know a lot about college sports in America. Well, no, because like when you I no when idea. you're a teenager in this country and someone says something to co- about going to college, the first thing you think is the local tech. You know, what I mean, mm. like for for us, it was, yeah. it was South Trafford College, and you, you know, you'd sort of be like, college basket, what? Yeah, and, so this and, guy's giving me a Stanford T-shirt and yeah, a Stanford yeah. hat, and he's like, "Fill these papers in," and I'm like, "Well, I've got, I've got GB. I was playing for G- yeah, yeah. GB at the weekend. For what? I'm like, I can't, I can't." Yeah, yeah. And I then I, I and I, it was getting too much because at one stage I'm playing because if living in Worthing there was no national league team, yeah. so no like the equivalent of like BBL or national league basketball. There was none. No, I had to travel to Sutton, yeah. which is like. Croydon ish, like across from Croy. So we're talking South London yeah, area. Yeah. I did. I had to go to Sutton and Cheam to play National League. Yeah. So then I ended up playing London League for them as well. And at one stage, I'm playing juniors and seniors for Worthing in Sussex League and Sussex Cup. And I'm playing juniors and seniors for Sutton in the Junior London League, Junior National Cup. Senior London League, Senior National Cup, and Senior National League, and I just had to—I couldn't play basketball anymore, basically. So was there? It was, was just too much. Were you thinking I'm going to be a pro water polo player if there is such a thing? Didn't didn't realise you could be. At that stage. That didn't realise you that could a be a pro you, water polo player. Would you be a pro? Or would you? No, I did have an offer later on to be semi-pro in Germany. Right. Um. But it's again, like, it's like, one of them sports, isn't it? Where it's like, yeah, in Germany, it's like you went to complete Vatapolo. <laughs> Vatapolo. Yeah, Vatapolo. Because <laughs> we, I, we had a couple of tournaments in Stuttgart, and right. um, yeah, I could have. But you know, you, this later on, it became more evident that it would have been 
more than possible to do it. Yeah. it and some of the guys later on the GB squad would be would get sent away to play in Spain or wherever and play professional. So you must have played with guys that have played in the Olympics and stuff like that. Then. I did, yeah. yeah. I played with Craig. I played with Craig Figes. I played with um, Sean King, who's mates with Ashley Hamilton. Weirdly, they went to the same school, right. both Olympians as well. Went to Trinity. Played with Jack Waller. Played with Jack Waller. I think I must have coached Jack Waller at one stage because I coached county level for a bit. And Jack Waller played in the Olympics. But... um. And did it do your head in when you saw them playing in the Olympics, thinking that could have been No, I was too that. old by then. I was, Craig Figes is my age, and he played in the Olympics, but he's a freak. Right. <laughs> he's a freak of nature. Like, I was too old, but I was 37, I think, by then. Yeah. Because it's like that, you know, that thing where you see your peers going on to do bigger, better things, and you have that sort of bitter pill thing. I never... I've ne- well, yeah, but I'd had, it, I'd had it shattered. It was well shattered by then. I had a series of events, mate, that would have... Yeah. Like... I played. I dedicated my life to 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 water polo at Worthing and Sussex. Regardless, I'd go and play for Sutton, but I would always come back to my home club, Worthing, and I'd bring everything back with me. And I would take training. I would be the coach. Me and a guy called Scott Orchard both went up there and played for Sutton, and would come back and take training and and try and try and drag our little local team like out of the dust, yeah. like, you know, out of the out of the Stone Ages. And we succeeded because they're one of the most successful teams out there now they're like they i dragged i when i <laughs> i was a driving force into getting them to get into the national league but it was purely selfish i didn't i, I was sick of traveling yeah yeah i was sick of going because at that time i was playing for invicta which is a kent-based team i was going to swanley and fucking mainstone for training right uh, uh and i just was sick of it and i so i've i convinced the coach at worthing to to enter national league and and now they're doing incredibly well. They're doing really well. But um, it was, yeah, so I did all that. And then the club kept chucking me out of the, like what they call the fast lane, uh, training lane, which, you know, you get two hours on a Tuesday, two hours on a Thursday. Still not enough. I was still doing my own training yeah. as well. Like you're training six, five to six days a week. And then polo training was Tuesday night after training, Wednesday night for two hours, Thursday night after training. We picked up a Monday session and we had a Sunday session as well. But um, we did all this to sort of put Worthing on the map in terms of water polo, but the, the swimming club side of it, which, and I hope somebody does listen to this, is tin pot and shite. Like, it, it never swam to any decent standard. Right. The, we're talking like Speedo League Division one, like Division 4 or something, and... <laughs> county league but not high like you would lose every week I mean I was 14 and I was swimming in open age group so I'm swimming against men mm. because this, the club was just didn't have enough good swimmers it just wasn't very good but they would keep chucking me out the fast lane because I wouldn't do galas like swimming water, doing water polo for them coaching the fucking all the teams for them wasn't enough so I had that and then we had we managed to get there's a men's tournament, right? There's always kids, all the young, like under 16s, under 19s, probably like basketball. There's county yeah. standard events where the county teams go. But there was never a men's one. And then they, we discovered there was a men's one. And me and Scotty Orchard roped in. We had seven players, Sussex players, that were going to go and play in this men's county tournament. And five, four or five of the guys dropped out in, in the morning of that day, so we couldn't go. And Scotty's phoned me up in the morning and said, we can't go, we haven't got enough players. And I put the phone down and within five minutes, the Kent manager phoned me up because he was also my National League manager. Fred Holhouse, bless him, rest in peace, he's passed away now. He phoned me up and said, I've heard Sussex aren't coming. I said, well, I've only just found out, how do you know? He said, do you want to come and play for Kent? I was like, yeah, go on then. So he axed someone from his Kent team and I went and played, <laughs> went and played for Kent. So it fucks up, mate. I started. I started. (laughs) So I went and played for Kent. A week later, I get a letter from Sussex County, Sussex, um, the Sussex (laughs) committee, telling me I'm banned from playing for Sussex for a season because I've played for Kent. It's just so I had that. The worst one, though. This is the worst one. It was my last shout, really, at being involved with Great Britain to a high standard, and I got picked. A squad of about, I forget now, it was, it was a few, like 20, 25, maybe 30, 
all around the age of 25 it was like our it was going to be our squad we're going to uh, you know it was going to be a decent GB squad that they were hoping to keep together for a while for European qualifi- qualifiers and whatever and whatnot. And I really like we got notification of it and I trained even harder, did extra sessions and I was well up for it. And the morning of the uh of the trials um I've literally I've packed my my mum and dad when I were away that weekend because they would have taken me because they took me everywhere, bless them. Yeah. They were away that weekend and I was being picked up. I believe it was Scotty. Scott Orchard was picking me up as well. And he wasn't even... He just was going to take me. He wasn't even... Uh, he wasn't even competing because he was a bit older than me. He was out of age. And uh, I'm literally sat by the door waiting for waiting for my lift. And my phone rung. And it was Fred Holhouse. And he said, I'm terribly sorry. It's been a real mix-up. Um, the trials were last week. And I was like, oh. So... When when do we get a shot? When's the retrial? He said, "No, they've they've picked the squad. That's it." Jeez. And I just was like, I sat on the stairs and cried. Yeah. I think for about an hour. Yeah. It's gutted, this and I I nearly gave up. I nearly quit this then. And, and it's it, <sighs> sports is such a important thing to kids. I see it now, what mm. it means to them, and. When I see my daughter in tears of frustration after practice or something, mm. I, I get it. You know what I mean? Mm. Because it can break your heart. Yeah, it does. You know, being told that you're not good enough at something can can break your heart. And I mean, it it was <sighs> at the school I went to, Wim High School, is was sort of in the Warrington postcode, and Warrington's oh, right. a huge rugby. Sound. I was going to and say, at, yeah. at school, it was rugby this, rugby that. You know, not even football wasn't really on the radar. It was rugby, and, rugby league as well. Yeah. Well, no, it's that's the funny thing. It was rugby union. <clears throat> oh, well, yeah. There was guys that uh, I mean, the Warrington rugby teams, rugby league. But I was going to say, yeah. you played rugby union, and oh, the, well. the, the, there was a couple of guys from my school that that went on to play for uh, for England. You know, nice. a guy that was actually on on the basketball team with me. Um, I, oh, I right. remember just bumping into one of the old guys and, oh, <laughs> oh do you ever hear from so and so? And I just went, oh, what straddle up to these days? And everyone went quiet. And I'm like, what? And I thought they were going to say, oh, he, he, you know, he died in a oh, freak shit. accident. No, that's not where it went. They were like, are you no. serious? And I'm like, well, yeah. And this kid was like, he was like, a, he was one of them kids that was amazing at all sports. Yeah, just not even just good at them. He was the fastest, the quickest, the yeah. best at everything. And I'm like, what? And they're like, he plays for England rugby and for Saracens or Harlequins or one. Of, and I'm like, Harlequins. sure. Because yeah, no he was like a streak of piss. He was dead thin and skinny, <laughs> wiry, but, but, but a, a skillful player. And I was like, sure. So I go on Google. Sure enough, it's like, oh my god, the guy's a—he's a beast. He's huge. Yeah, amazing. David yeah. Strattle, um, who went on to have a bunch of caps. I think he played at the World Cup for England and all that lot. But our school was—it was rugby basically. And it wasn't until in the sixth form, um, our school had a leisure centre built into it. Uh, oh, nice. And the guy that ran it was this guy from Manchester, which is like sort of. 15 miles away from Lynn and uh, he wanted to start a basketball team so for me it was like ah, oh, because you only ever got to play basketball at school in PE now and again and at that point if that, yeah yeah we never but, played it in but, PE but it was like the school standouts were all rugby players you know it was like oh yeah he's yeah. a geezer you know all the girls fancied him and you know what I mean and I was like <laughs> not bad you know what I mean it's like uh, what a tosser and anyway I got really good at, at basketball and I remember them doing it in PE and I was in the same group as these rugby superstars and it was like right I'm having you you know what I mean it's like they, nice. they were interested and I just ran a mock you know what I mean and, and the teachers were like Masters Masters is good at this game you know what I mean it's like <laughs> playing out of school it was that chance. To, it was like the, the one time I got to be the best at something instead of being just regular 
You know what I mean? Yeah. And because basketball meant nothing to many people at school, it was my time awesome. to, to shine. Nice. I like that. Should we do it one? More See, time? we didn't. What, we. I'm just thinking about it now. Like you, you saying that like all these basketball wise, particularly with like Yorick and obviously the Jones brothers going through. We there was only really one dude, uh, Rani Malik. His name was. Right. And he had a brother called Remy Malik. Right. Nothing to do with the the movie stuff. Right. But Rani played, f- like made his way through and played for the Thunder, yeah. like the Worthing in Thunder, and he because the first final the Bears had been at. 2003 cup final I went to watch the final and the same f- finals weekend Thunder are playing and, and Rani was playing which was pretty cool yeah but I was better than him <laughs> was well, frustrating. Yeah, I mean Manchester is a tough <laughs> gig though because cause, you know it's a big city I mean it's, it's bigger a, it's much it's bigger a than, very yeah. urban place and you know mm. there, there was there was ballers there was a lot of ballers in Manchester um you know, to, playing for my county of Trafford was was you know the the, the high light. Yeah. I'd say, but it was always that one where you know when you get to that age of sort of eighteen, where it's like, well, where do you go from here? Because I'm now mm. too old to be considered for. Yeah. You know, everyone that's gonna, it's depressing. Yeah, well, yeah, everyone that's going to make it is already doing it. You know, like the Yorick's and the Mike Bernard. So yeah, th- those guys <clears throat> had already been playing for the Giants for two or three years. Mm. You, you know, you start the, the everyone starts sort of separating a bit, and um, about all there was was sort of, you know, playing more local league stuff, which was good. But in the back of your head, you know that, well, you know, I'm 18 now. You know, if it was going to happen to the level I wanted it to happen, it would have happened. Mm. Yeah. And it's that one where you sort of like, you know, you look back at it and it's like the big highlight for a lot of guys my age was um, they used to have a thing called the Greater Manchester Youth Games. And it was basically a yearly thing and it was the Olympics, but for, 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 for the youth of Manchester. Wicked. So you'd have like every discipline and basketball was in it. And um, you'd, you'd play a tournament against all the other teams like, you, you know, Manchester, Stockport, Trafford, mm. you know, they'd all be in there. And, um, you know, you were considered in the sort of upper level of the sport if you played for a team in that. And, mm. you know, that was kind of where it went. But also what you sort of think later on is, yeah, that's the tournament where the, the coaches, the, the, the Giants are watching going, right, I love him, I love him. I love mm. him. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, I'd love to. It, it, it's just a shame that, you know, things aren't recorded in the same way as they are now because I'd love to read through the names of everyone that played in those two youth games I played in because I'm sure there's oh, guys. There'll, there'll be some it, names it, there. Yeah, yeah. It'd, be, it'd be scary. And, and you're going, whoa, yeah. Uh, I remember we played the team that actually went in as Manchester. And they were just menacing. I was talking to Joe Forber about this last night. Um, <laughs> the great Joe Forber. He, were, he founded the Magic. And um, he was like, yeah, and do you remember who used to win that tournament every year? And I just went, Manchester. And he's like, they were tough kids. Because <laughs> you know, these these no, they, these were these were street guys. You know mm. what I mean? Mm. You know, a lot of guys out of areas like uh, Moss Side, Old Trafford, yeah. you know, uh, alongside places like that. And they would destroy you. You know, you'd go on the court afraid because you knew what was about to happen. You know mm. what I mean? Mm. Um, and I'd love to have seen who was on that floor who went on to to do do the kind of things that they do. Where You can sort of work it out by ages and stuff. You know, where Yorick was probably in it yeah. um, and, and a few guys. But they were the ones that were beating teams like 80 points to 12 and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Different level. Yeah, and it was just like, fucking hell. And then after that, you know, you sort of, um, you accept that it's not going to pan out the way you had it in your head where you suddenly become noticed by a scout in America and you go to college and then you you play four years at college and then you just go to the NBA. You just become a pro, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like the dream's over in it. It's like, nah, forget it. And, yeah. That's when I I don't know you sort of 
progressed from there, but I sort of had started getting into music and veered oh, well, your, your music in, in that direction. Your career is illustrious, mate. It was okay. Tell us about it, please, because you've told me about... I mean, I, I was a huge Oasis fan back in the 90s, and... I went to watch... Went your to rendition of, of how you and Bonehead were practically... <laughs> Bosom buddies was like, what the f- I um I went to watch Liam last week at the Etihad with my daughter. Did you? Yeah, and it was absolutely mega. Did he do some Oasis tracks? Oh, he did loads. Of course he and, did. And, course and, he did. And, and, That's and his it best was, material. <laughs> yeah, but it was one of them. It Having done thousands of gigs, played them, worked at them, watched you know what i mean i've not mm. been out front as a punter for years oh, and really? it and it blew my head off you know my daughter's face it's like you know sixty thousand people mm. with with the phone light on singing wonderwall Ugh. i was like oh, you know i'm fair you know what i mean it's mm. like you know i've stood on stage with liam well sort of behind an amplifier while liam's doing a gig and you're going yeah this is sick but actually being a punter at the front was like whoa this is this is a bit of a you know i'm glad that my daughter's come to this because it's like yeah my first proper gig was liam gallagher at the etihad and it's already been talked about as a sort of legendary manchester gig you know what i mean good i'm glad but yeah i love i love that i'd love for them to get back together again i mean then it's like you, you, you know. It, it, it surprised me when you first told me you were a big Oasis fan because I know that everybody has their era, but I truly believe that we were lucky to be growing up in the nineties. The nineties oh, was was our sixties. You know what I mean? And oh, I know God, that's. Yeah. It, but it's like, and people go, "Oh, yeah," but every generation has that—the seventies, the sixties, like, and it's yeah, like, but the, see, yeah, I but was, I was a big hip hop fan. As, well, me too. But the here's Oasis the thing, though, thing was an anomaly. Like, it well, yeah. pubs, right? You go on about it, right? And and people like you. you I ask my mum and dad about the sixties all the time, and then the seventies. The eighties was shit. You know what I mean? Unless unless you were really on the cutting edge of cool and you were into things sweets, like sweets were good in the eighties. Yeah, sweets were good. Half penny sweets, mate. Not even penny wise, sweets. Music wise, <laughs> you were either listening to bloody utter rubbish or uh, to, to power. I think. Or yeah, I've been. Yeah, I had a to power album. Yeah, yeah, but you weren't listening to. You know, at our age, you weren't listening to the Smiths. No. You know what I mean? No. So, you know, that was about all that came out of music in the in the 80s, you know what I mean? Things mm. like the Smiths and that sort of thing. But you had to be really cool and on it to be mm. into all that. But then the 90s, I cannot... I try and explain to my daughter how the 90s changed the world Oh God! from yeah. the minute 1990 struck. And then you go on... I, I hear people talking about, oh, yeah... I was around in the noughties, and I'm like, oh, shut up. Nothing happened was, in the noughties. Do you know what I mean? It was, Nothing tale, it was a tale off of the nineties. Nothing happened in the noughties. Nothing's really happened in the in the, the 20 teens or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> the nineties was the last decade. My my daughter, I don't know about yours, my daughter, but, um, I, I, I have a quite an eclectic music taste. Like I was big, NWA dropped. Um, yeah. And I was the biggest Ice Cube fan. Right, first, all right, first gangster rap album you got? Uh, America's Most Wanted. Right, mine was one Oak. that I owned that was America's Most Wanted. But but Did we, you, I had a copy uh, of. Was it in the original in the original box? To cassette, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a copy that someone. No, no, no. I had a copy of Straight Out of Compton, and I had a copy right. of the next one, which I can't say because obviously the title of it is highly offensive. But F L Four Zag. Yeah, backwards. That's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well. Yeah, the first one I America's had. Most wanted, I bought with my own right. money. I can't remember what the first one I bought was. The first rap album I ever got was someone did me a copy of Ice T's OG album. Oh, mate, that was a great album. Yeah, it was. And re- I, I recently bought it on CD. Did and you? that was one of them where you're listening to it. God, I can smell, I can smell yeah. 1991. Takes you back. Do, do you know what I mean? So, yeah, but it was an NWA, Ice T. Um, I think the first one I actually bought 
and this is going to sound so fucking cool now, was the Chronic. Oh, that was late. That was, yeah, that was his first solo one, wasn't it? was, what, 92, something like that? That was awesome, yeah. Yeah, and it was when the Might world first... Might have been 91, first, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was when awesome. the first the, the world first met Snoop Dogg. It Snoop certainly Dogg was. Dogg. See that and album I remember, as well. And that I remember, yeah, go on, yeah. Seeing, where did I see it? You know the video to Dre Day. Yeah, yeah. Um, where him and Snoop are in a garage and he's all like, "Bow, wow, wow." wow. Yeah. I saw that on the Word or something. Oh, the Word with Terry Christian. Yeah, yeah. And Danny Bear. Yeah, um, hub, hubba hubba. Um, and yeah, I mean, does it? I mean, I know that the hip hop began in the eighties, um, but oh, but it went it, it went the nineties where it's it yeah. went stratospheric. But I mean, you look at what happened in the nineties, perhaps to guys like you and me, you you discover gangster rap, hmm. you into the NBA, right, and then just to curveball your life. Britpop happens now. Yeah. When that happened, I was so into rap, hip hop music. Same I mean, I, I dressed like yeah. a, you know what I mean. Fubu, I had but, Fubu yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, Fu- stuff. Tom, Tommy Hilfiger, Mecca, all that. Mecca, like. but, yeah. And and everyone, all my mates were all like proper mopheads, Britpop, you know, into all that stuff. But I just was into music, and mm, it used to piss me off when at school. You had the grunge kids that were into Nirvana. Oh, I had that as well. And and but but here's the thing: behind the scenes, I was out at Woolworths buying Nevermind. Um, I remember getting def. Uh, I don't think I bought definitely. Maybe I was fully aware of it. I bought a single. I think I bought, I bought whatever. I bought whatever. That's the first yeah, single, yeah. Oasis single I bought. Yeah, um, it and I had. Too, wasn't it? Yeah, my sister had it on tape. The album, and I seem Mate, to remember it's always on tape. A copy. Yeah. yeah um, and I had this sort of like undercover thing where I didn't sort of, you know, people would be like, oh, you're into this American rap music. You're not cool enough to listen to. And it was like, yeah, well, bollocks to you because I've actually got these albums under the radar. You know what I mean? And I, I started playing guitar because of it. Yeah. And that was ended it. up in a band. I was in a band as well. Oh, mate. So, <laughs> you know, whilst you, it was like, I don't know about you, but in the 90s, I was quite a confused person in hindsight <laughs> because I was completely absorbed in American culture, oh, the yeah. music, yeah. the sports. I was in America more than I was here because I had family there mm. and I'd be out there sometimes twice, three times a year in mm. Atlanta, Georgia. Um, but at the same time, and I don't mind saying it now, I was aware that this Britpop thing Mm. And the and the culture, the train spotting thing in the, mm. you know, you think about things that define the nineties and new labour and all that. I was fully fucking aware that that was all going on. Oh good. But yeah. it it was almost like, especially in England, you weren't allowed to be into everything. You were into hip hop, so you dressed like an American, which we did. Yeah. yeah. Or you were into Britpop and you wore scruffy baggies and you had a moped and then there was the guys that were, thought they were punks because they were dad. Well, that's I was just going to say about the punk. Like I was a, I loved, I had a big fan of Green Day. I had the, I had yeah, yeah. My best Dookie mate was, and whatnot was and my best mate. Um, Newfound Glory and all that lot. Yeah, yeah. Was was into to all that. Well, my um, daughter now listens to it. My daughter knows my track came on on my one of my playlists on Spotify, one of my liked songs, and it was a newfound glory song, and I'd right. forgotten the words. I once knew them, I'd forgotten yeah. them. My and daughter knew the words. Says, yeah, yeah. She's it's twenty. Mad. It's mad. And she so, listens to newfound glory, uh, Blink One Eight Two, like yeah, Song yeah. Forty One. She loves. But I, that. I'll ask me stuff about the nineties, and it's like, oh, but you know, weren't you into basketball and all that? I'm like, well, yeah, but I was fully aware that. Bands like Oasis were changing the world. Yeah. And, it, and I remember being in America one summer and I was round at some friend's house. And um, if you were into Britpop in America, you were considered cool. You know what I mean? It was a real subculture. Cult, I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, and Oasis had just started to break. And they showed, they did the, uh, do you remember MTV? Oh, what was it called? Behind the scenes. No. Um, 
unloaded or something like it was a it was just like a show about a band and okay. it was like the history of the band um and it and mm. was the most of them and mm. they did one on oasis and it was quite funny because me and my best friend were there yeah. we're from manchester and they all thought we sounded like the gallagher's and i remember we were watching it <laughs> and they had subtitles on <laughs> Because the Americans couldn't understand the Gallagher's accents, and we yeah. were sat looking at each other going, "Fucking up, what? Why is the subtitles on?" And they're all reading it, going, "What does that mean?" And it's like, "Well, no, Gallagher's just basically said he's a cock, he's a knobhead, and this is shit." And they're like, "Oh my god, that's amazing!" And I'm like, "So sort of about we it? speak all the time, you know what I mean?" Yeah. It's like, you know, I've uh, got, I've got you saying, I've got. Um... Just made me think. Uh, sibling rivalry. Do you remember the argument they had that was recorded? Yes, I've got I that have on it. record. I, I, oh, really? That's yeah. worth a bob or two. That. I've got it on CD. That you know that, that made it into the charts. Yes, yeah. Well, because, I got one. Well, I remember buying it from from Woolworths again. Seven inch. It, it made it made the charts, and it was a, a recording that a journalist did. He put he, he hit record, didn't he? That's on right. His dictaphone. Recorded the argument, and, and, he, and he got a fifteen minute argument. And it is if you listen it's to hysterical. it now, hysterical. It's utter genius. Oh, it's, it's just utter, it's throw the TV uh, out the window. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go on then, throw it out the window. Oh, I don't want to do that right now. Yeah, it's it's like, absolutely brilliant. The, the best bit in it for me is when uh, they're arguing about the Beatles or something, and, and oh, Noel goes, know? "Oh, do you know John do Lennon?" You know him, yeah. And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, I do." And he's like, "You must be How pretty old, old then." Yeah, yeah. How old are you? Twenty. <laughs> yeah. I'm twenty thousand and fucking. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, mate, I used to know that back to front, but I mean, it's uh, like I got that. I got "Don't Look Back in Anger" as well on Seven Inch Record because that was the first number one. Yeah. No, second, second number one. That was Noel's mm. Noel's first one. Mm. But you couldn't escape it, you know what I mean? It's no. like, it's like, it was, it was yeah, everything. everything to me at the moment is this sort of American gangster rap thing. And yes, I read the source and hip hop connection, you know what I mean? Mm. But I dig Oasis, mm. and I like the odd Blur song, and I like the odd Suede song, and yeah. you know what I mean? It was Echo like Belly, men's work, uh, and yeah. it's like you know, you want at the time you don't say it out loud. But in hindsight, you you just wish you was just like, you know what? It's all right to be into everything, you know? Hmm. Well, this is it. But I think it was a bit different down south because I, I like I said, I, I picked up the guitar, learned to play the guitar and started, we were in a band and we would do Oasis covers and yeah. whatnot. And then, but at the same time, I was in a, <laughs> a boys, <laughs> boys to men tribute <laughs> band. What? <laughs> I've got a minute. We, we did. I've got a minute. <laughs> you were in a boys to men tribute band. We did some boys to men stuff. Yeah. Which boy? Which member of boys to men were you? I was. I was two. Uh, oh, I can't remember their names. Hang on. I look up was, which two I used to do. Because there was one with a walking <laughs> stick. Which one was that? No, I was the dude with the glasses and and the little dude who was loud. I can't remember their names at all. So, Which hang on a minute, weird. Pabs. Mm. A white dude from Brighton. I know. Was a boys to Men tribute band. Yeah. And could you hit those notes? Oh, yeah. I'm a good singer. <laughs> that is astonishing. And <laughs> we came second is... in Battle of the Bands, and we lost out to a band called Tender. This is when I sang... We lost, like, we lost out to a band called Oasis. <laughs> we lost out to, no, they were a band... At the time, they were called Tenderfoot. And then they got a record deal, and they changed their name to Wookie. Really? And they did all right. They did. I don't think they. Did is there video the footage of this? Is there video? There footage? Is, there's very early footage of three of us on stage singing. Uh, Although we, we did, come we did whatever. To the end. Oh right, I'm still. No, so, I'm, is, I'm still trying I don't think to get any my head video round. Footage of the boys to men. I'm still trying to get my head round you being. But in we a boys sung, we adventure. sung whatever, and I sung "I'd like to be under the sea" at the end of whatever because I'd seen Noel do it. on Because Noel did it, yeah, yeah. And then we sung a song that we both that we all wrote, and then we sung a song from. Do you remember California Dreams? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we sung yeah. A song from that. We sung Mom, a song right. "Too Much to Dream." Look it up. Wow. It's a great song. Oh my God! If yeah, only YouTube. That, there's existed. footage of that. I've got well, I mean, there's, there's there's footage of me on YouTube mm. when I got into bands. And, yeah, uh, like you were more legit than me. I saw just this is just a 
it's just what it is, isn't it? It's well, like what was, your, what was your role in the band? Bass. You're a bass player. Yeah. Oh, what it is is when when I decided that um, I was no longer afraid to show that I liked all types of music. Mm. My best mate was a really good guitarist, and I got him to teach me a few chords. And I got a guitar, a dead cheap guitar, and just taught myself. I bought. Um, yeah, I, I, I remember I went to Johnny Orodos Music in Manchester, which is a legendary guitar shop, and I bought a cheap acoustic, and I bought an Oasis chord book and a Stone Roses <laughs> chord book. Stone and Roses. I sat there and persevered until I could play something that I knew, and then. Yeah, that was that. And when I did decide, I, I started a band and it was dead funny because I knew that I wanted to start a band, didn't have any idea, you know, what what to do. And I happened to become mates with a, with a guy who played guitar and I was like, right, we're starting a band. Oh, right, are we? Okay. Uh, what, just the two of us playing guitars? No, no, we'll work all that out later. And, and um, I remember I worked with a guy... Um, I know I worked with this woman and she said to me, oh, my uh, my husband plays the drums. And I was like, does he? Right, tell him he's in a band. <laughs> and then it was like, we started jamming and, and all this. Like, and uh, it was like, right, what do we need now? Oh, yeah, a bass player. Um, and Phil's brother, who was the, the main guitarist, didn't play an instrument. And I was like, do you want to be in a band? And he's like, what? And I'm like, yeah, we need a bass player. And he's like, well, I don't, I don't play the bass. And I was like, look, it can't be that hard. You just, you know, put your finger on there and pluck play it. The top string start off, isn't it? Just play the yeah. top string. Yeah. And and it's if you think about it, it's it's like at the time you're not thinking, oh yeah, this is proper punk. This it's like you start yeah. a band because there's a whole thing about you know so many punk that was bands. The nineties, isn't it? Everyone had a band. Well, I mean, there's the famous thing. I don't know if you've seen that new thing that's on about the Sex Pistols on Disney. Um, and the whole thing with the pistols was that none of them could play an instrument, no. but decided to start a band. Or sing, yeah. Yeah, and in a way, that was kind of how how you did it. In a way, it was like you, you sort of formed a band and then worried about uh, yeah to play something. And we <laughs> um, and it and it turned out that once I got going, very much from the the Noel Gallagher influence, I realised that with about six chords, you could write. Pop songs, yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah. Four, Beatles, you four yeah. yeah. And you know, I found I found myself writing these little tunes that were all right. And then you know, you get the confidence to let someone hear it and go, "Yeah, that's all right." That. And before you know it, you've got a little band going. And yeah, it's it's, it's funny, but yeah, the the, the band after that was uh, because I played guitar and sang in that band. How and wicked! When we were choosing who the singer was going to be, out of the four of us including the drummer and drummers never sing unless you're in the Eagles. Unless you're Phil Collins. And, or Phil Collins. <laughs> it was like, right, none of us can sing. Who's the best out of the four shit singers we've got? <laughs> and it was me. <laughs> and I tell you now, when I hear recordings that we did, I wince at my voice <laughs> and the lyrics. And it's like so innocent. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like all we want. My mate's to- got a load of stuff. We wanted to sound like the Stone Roses with a bit of Oasis. And, yeah, that was that. But, Ten- we yeah. had T- Tenacious D was a big deal as well. It was a big influence. Oh, yeah, my mate. Jack, Jack Black. Yeah, Jack Black, Carl Gass. They, yeah. they were, we saw them live twice as well at the Brighton Centre, which was yeah. amazing. My, my biggest regret with, with, with the music side of the 90s was the mm. fact that I vividly remember... My, my mate's brother and his mates getting tickets for Oasis at Main Road. And we were like, just a bit too young to probably A, be allowed to go and B, really get what the point, you know, you mm. know, we didn't really get that this was going to become an era defining gig. Mm. Um, and I remember them stood all in a circle with like, trying to phone through to ticket line to get the tickets and all that lot. Yeah, and then, no I, internet then. I, I remember being bored one weekend because a load of them had gone to Nebworth. Oh. Um, and to me, the thought of going to a big fucking festival wearing Jordans and stuff like that, it was like, nah, don't think so. We had a teacher went to Nebworth. Yeah. He bought me and, back a poster. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, I regret that 
you know, I didn't go to any of the sort of real. I mean, I saw Oasis in the late nineties. Um, Where did you see them? I saw them, I believe, at Old Trafford Cricket Ground. Oh wow! And I saw them, I think, at the Reebok Stadium. Oh, you saw was, them twice. Yeah, um, I think I've got a load of tickets. And the thing is, was I'm going to be honest with you, Pabs. Around that sort of time, I discovered rock and roll, and I don't remember a lot of the gigs <laughs> I went to, to be honest. <laughs> Um, uh, good stuff. People often say, oh, do you remember that time we saw so-and-so? I'm like, uh, no. no. It, it happened. Yeah. yeah. Um, flicking through my box of ticket stuff, sometimes I'm like, I Jesus, did, <laughs> I fucking hell, did I see him? Nice one. But yeah, where did you see him? Uh, well, they came to Brighton, and I didn't, I didn't go when they came to Brighton. My mate Craig Rakes and his brother went. But the Brighton gig was the famous gig where someone chucked a bottle on stage and they left. They did one and a half songs and they right. left and went home. Um, which is quite a regular thing at that Which is side. hysterical. I don't think they wanted to be in Brighton in the first place, to be honest. But I saw them at uh, Milton Keynes Bowl on the wow. um, Don't Believe the Truth tour. Wow. And that was epic. That was amazing. And I took my mum. Mm. Because my mum was a massive Beatles fan. And yeah. She never got to see the Beatles. And she right. was like, well, this is the closest thing to it. Let's right. Go. So we went. Okay. So in 2001, Paul McCartney did his Back in the World tour. Yeah. Like a major, major world tour. And he'd not done anything like that for. No, I remember. Ever. Because mm. he was doing like all the Beatles, all the Wings stuff. And I got two tickets. Band on the run and all that. Yeah. yeah. And I went with my mum to yeah. the MEN Arena and watched Macca. And it was one of the best nights ever because, like you, my mum was slightly too young to go and see the Beatles. But when she was a kid, they were everything. You know, mm. she got every yeah. album what day it came out. Her dad would mm. get it. And me and my mum sank Hey Jude arm in arm. Oh. And do you know what? It's like he gets a lot of jit, doesn't he, McCartney? But I always, going, that's why. Well, I always turn around and say to people, yeah, but he wrote fucking Blackbird. He wrote, you know. Hey Jude, let it be. Hey Jude, let it be. You know what I mean? And then later on he wrote Band on the Run to show up. You know what I mean? Mm. It's like, mm. you know, but to, yeah, I get that. Going with your but here's the mad thing, Pops. It would have been a similar time that at the back end of the 90s, that bit going into 2000 when Eminem broke. Oh yeah, and he became a world-changing Massive. artist. Yeah. And I remember in that year, I went to watch Eminem um, uh, on the Marshall Mathers tour, the one where he actually oh. had the the house from the front of the album on stage. <laughs> it, was the, it was it was the European leg of the Up in Smoke tour without Dr. Dre, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. I saw him. I saw Limp Biscuit a week oh, later. Oh, Limp Biscuit. And I think I might have seen Impossible Two soundtrack. Yeah, yeah. And I think I might have seen Oasis that year as well. Fantastic. So it's like you look at it and go, you know, wow. You know, yeah. like if, for me, when I'm talking to sort of someone from my parents' generation, like the other day, out of nowhere, my dad, I was, we were talking about gigs, and my, I said to my dad, well, "What was the first gig you went to?" And he was like, "Oh, that would have been 1970. I watched the uh, watched the Who do Tommy at Lancaster." Oh. I was like, you did what? You saw the Who? I'm like, you saw the Who doing Tommy in 90s. You know, and it's almost like, you know, these gigs from the past that mm. are so legendary, they didn't really happen. Mm. And I'm always mesmerized by people who tell me that they saw the Beatles or Bowie in the 70s or yeah. Led man. Zeppelin. And, you know, I've, I've, I had a mate who was at uh, Led Zeppelin's Nebwith gig. In wow. seventy nine, you know, I had a mate who saw Pink Floyd in the in the seventies doing the Wall. <laughs> I mean, and you can't get your head round it. No. And my daughter can't get a head round. I saw Eminem when he was at his absolute height when he came on stage wearing dungarees with a chainsaw. Yes, and the Mars, the friend of the, the Jason Mars. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And it's normal. like you know. I mean, it was. Uh, I mean, remember it though. It was like they tried oh, to ban him. It was they tried to ban him playing in Manchester. There was like full Did on they? on the news. They wanted to ban him playing because 
um, something to do with drugs or something. Like you pretend to. Well, they they worked on the influence thing for a while, didn't they? Yeah, the yeah. Bad influence. Yeah. That. Because that was always the thing as well, wasn't it? Culturally at the time, is like they they could black rappers they just let it go it's you know black rappers are reflecting black lives they didn't seem to give a shit yeah yeah a white rapper came along and yeah. had an effect on white people that was evident yeah suddenly it's a problem oh god i mean i remember the gig and um it was fucking brilliant as you can imagine of course and it was, yeah. i remember seeing mums and dads who taking their kids to the <laughs> and just being absolutely gobsmacked going <laughs> What on earth is what is going on here? You know, sort of covering the kids' ears. Yeah, I've got a bootleg of that gig somewhere, um, and it was just like. Um, but it was, it was. I remember going and queuing up at the arena to get tickets, and it sold out. And back then, it was like the windows just came down, sold out, and you were like, oh. "Shit!" I bought the ticket. I paid a tout, an obscene amount of money for two tickets <laughs> for me and my mates. Yeah, like at the time, like two hundred quid or something. Wow! Because you, you know, you just couldn't miss it. Yeah, you couldn't miss I mean? it. It's, no. It was like it was such a big deal at the time. Mm. Um but then it's like you know, you're still in this sort of ten years of where we became the people we are now in a way. Oh god yeah. Because what you you know, we've spent the last ten minutes talking about music and the oasis and stuff. In nineteen ninety six I remember staying up every night to watch the Seattle Chicago Bulls series. Yep. Absolutely. Me too. It, For that, you know, that next three years, that's what that's what I did. Stayed up every night, watched them beat Supersonics, and the Utah, beat Utah Jazz. And then the last one, I've just I have vivid memories of of Jordan's last shot. I was at my mate Rich's house. Yeah. He was he was in the picture. He was in the the ground with me, the arena with me, watching the Bears. Yeah. I was at his house. I just remember being on my hands and knees for the last sequence of plays. Just like and staring at the TV, and we yeah. taped, taped it. And I've got the videos in a box over there. Yeah, I've I got. I don't know if I showed you when the last when the last dance came out. Yeah, yeah, you've written it, it on me because I that's what I'd had written on. You'd written those, it on, yeah. Yeah, I've got all of those all six games. I taped off Channel Four with Mark Webster and all that lot. Well, I'll tell you something funny about I Mark wrote Webster. It, the last dance. Right, so. In my time as Bonehead's guitar tech. Oh, yes, um, where about? Yeah, you yes, um, um, we were at a gig in London and um, Bonehead used to do a lot of interviews before gigs because he's Bonehead from Oasis. <laughs> and the journalist in London that was covering the gig he was doing with this band he'd formed was Mark Webster. And Mark Webster walks into the dressing room and everyone's sort of like, who's this dude? And I went, fucking hell, Mark Webster. And he went, <laughs> and in that voice, that funny voice, he's going, uh, yeah, yeah, nice to meet you. And um, before he knew it, I'd whisked him out back out of the dressing room. And I was like, I'm, I'm going to blow your head now. And he went, what? And I was like, you have interviewed the equivalent of God. And he's looking at me going, what is this dickhead on about? And he's like, um, and he starts reeling off the names of musicians and, and footballers. I was like, you're not even close. And I went, you interviewed Michael Jordan and I've got it on tape. And his eyes lit up. And he's yeah. like, I don't remember the last time somebody recognized me because of basketball. And we sat down and I was like, right, Mark, you don't know me. I don't know you, but I need you to tell me every detail of when you interviewed Michael Jordan and he was buzzing and he went, right, I'll tell you what happened, right? So we'd finally got the interview. We'd been trying all season to get him, but you have to go through hoops to interview Jordan. And then his people say to you, right, you've got 12 minutes. Um, da di da di da And he's like, right, okay, I've got the interview. He said he was absolutely bricking it and he got yeah. put in this room and he sat down and there was just a chair in front of him. And he said that this door opened behind the chair and Michael Jordan walked in and sat down. There was no, hi, this is Michael. He sat down and just sat in front of him. Like he'd done it a billion times. He's like, he's done this so many times. He just sat down and looked at me going in a sort of, well, go on then. And he said, if you watch that footage, I'm like, uh, 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 and I was like, Oh my God. And he's like, I was like, what was he like? And he said, I'll tell you what, right. 
when he walks in that room, he had a glow around him. Mm. He 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 isn't normal. He 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 floats. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I totally get it because I've met some really famous people, and you An know, aura. Yeah. they just have this aura. You know, Liam is one of them people. Mm. It didn't matter how many times I met him, and you know, I was fortunate enough to to you know work with him. Um, when he walks in and you've not seen him for a while, he's just got this aura of coolness. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and he said that Jordan just had this glow around him and he forgot all his questions he was going to ask him and he was just a mess. That's amazing. And uh, But yeah, and, then he, and he's like, oh shit, I forgot I made some interview fucking bonehead about music. And I'm <laughs> like, sorry, mate, it's just that I watched your, I taped every single episode of NBA uh, Channel 4. Yeah, yeah. And he was buzzing. You know what I mean? Well, I'm gonna get. I've just found my. I found my PC, my video to PC converting thing as well. So I'm gonna. What I've got, I'm gonna get. Onto my computer and then get bits of it up on YouTube and Twitter and that. But I've I've a contrasting story to that. Two thousand and two, something like that. Uh, I was in Chicago. I was. I went to Chicago for a week on my own. <laughs> After travelling across South America with some mates. I, bo- I booked a week in got, Chicago on the way out because oh, I, I, I just say, had they, to go. But they got sick of you and gone, Gee, perhaps yeah. can you just, just do one? Just go to Chicago or something. We don't, uh, want to, we don't want to sit in the rainforest listening to you <laughs> talking about Alan Cunningham and Alton Bird. <laughs> just go to Chicago. Actually, weirdly, I was banging on about Kanye West at that stage and how good he was going to be because I had a couple yeah, of yeah. mixtapes before he'd... You know, he used to release like mixtapes when he was trying to be yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trying to make it, but I'd got hold of a couple of them. Uh, I saw him live actually, Kanye West. That was in Touch the Sky gig. That was awesome. The guy's yeah. a, he's a genius. He's a flawed genius, but he's a genius. Um, but no, I'm I'm in uh, Nike. I don't know what it would have been in Chicago, Nike Town or Nike Village. I can't remember. Nike but I'm in there it. buying some uh, low top blue and white Jordan Twelves, and uh, who walks in? Scoop Jackson. No. And I'm like. Scoop Jackson, and he looked at me like because uh, obviously I, English accent, of course. Yeah, yeah. In your in your, in your funny accent, Scoop Jackson looks looks at me like I probably thought you were Mark Webster. Looks, <laughs> <laughs> looks at me like I'm a psychopath, and I'm like, yeah. oh, I, I, I do that thing where you're like, oh, I want to say so many things, but I, yeah, yeah. I'm a big fan. Uh, you guys, you you covered the Chicago Bulls games for English TV and, and it was also he goes oh yeah yeah and he kind of relaxed a bit and yeah. I can't remember what he said he was, he's, he was cool he's a cool guy and then, no, he's uh, a dude he's an absolute he was, dude he was gone as quickly as he, he arrived probably because he just thought I was a bit weird but there's a really good podcast you know the two guys from Hoop Dreams have got a podcast and they had Scoop Jackson on it not long Did ago they? well he's Chicago I didn't realise he was Chicago Scoop yeah Jackson. yeah yeah, yeah, you know. big Chicago guy, but the editor of the wonderful Slam magazine as well for a long yeah. time. Yeah, the, ba- the Bible, as I I used to call it. <laughs> Listen, I've never been a big reader, and to quote co- to quote Garth Marenghi, any any Garth Marenghi fans out there, I've uh, probably written more news articles than I've actually read. Yeah, but I used to put the pictures up all over the place from Slam. Well, Slam was just, you know, that was the definitive hoops magazine oh 100% you know you've got to see the latest shoes yeah. fashions although yeah. I will say the uh, the newspaper British basketball newspaper that was out oh Slam Dunk Basketball UK I, I used mm. to love them Slam Dunk was utterly brilliant for the mm. what two years it it's existed. like a broadsheet as well it fold, unfolded yeah 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 a massive newspaper and it was always like, I remember at the time thinking, God, I hope this lasts a long time because this is fucking brilliant. Cause it was like, awesome. And it was up to date. It yeah. was like all the NBA stuff from that week, all the BBL, NBA, stuff. BBL, NBL Division 1, 2. Yeah. How long was all that going them. for? I saw if there was a collection of every one on eBay. Where? Uh, oh, ages ago. I, I would have bought that. Well, I was trying to get the guy to sell me the lot for like 30 quid or something. He's like, no, I want at least 300 quid. And it's oh, like, oh, Jesus. 
Yeah. That's I, I, I wrote into it loads of times and had my letters put in there. Have you got many copies? I've got, I've I got, got any. three, I think. I've got photocopies I've got of oh. one of my letters nice. that someone gave me because they'd found it. I've got Basketball UK, but I've got like two or three, but I've got the one uh, when Magic retired when he announced the, the HIV virus and everything. I've got that one, which also has a story in it about, I've forgotten his name, the... Um, and I've forgotten who he plays for. A BBL player getting shot outside a nightclub in in England. In Sheff, might have been Sheffield. I can't remember. Oh, really? Derby. Actually, it might have been Derby. I'll look it up and uh, and post it. You know, you got you got shot. It's only a small column. Gets shot in the shoulder. Jesus. Or shot in the shot through the arm or something outside a nightclub. Well, I've a I've a confession. Go on. It's it's a uh, it's a funny. It's a funny confession. At the time, I was, I was probably more devastated than I was overjoyed. Now we're talking ninety four, ninety five BBL season, and what would have been the ninety four, because the water polo seasons, they're, they're kind of, it's weird. It's kind of almost non stop. It's just it's all year round, effectively. A seasonal finish. And then fixtures for the next season will start what feels like straight away. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I played water polo for Worthing and local, in the Sussex League, which at the time was a was decent standard. It's not now. It's like there's about four teams left. But back in the day, it was a decent standard. And we won for the first time in 80 years. Worthing won the Sussex League. And the Sussex Cup did the double, which... And I think we we I think we made it through one of the rounds of the National Cup and then got knocked out by my other team, Sutton. Right. <laughs> but uh we got invited then to the sport the regional sports personality of the year awards. Right. For I think it was for the South. But it was held. It was. It may. Have, I don't think it was just Worthing. Anyway, I've got the medal somewhere. I'll have to dig it out. But we're the, bearing in mind this is '95, and this is the Bears' three-peat. Yeah. When Alan Cunningham and everybody managed to get there from seventh, and Alan Cunningham was MVP, and like it hadn't been done since Kingston. Right. And you know, three playoff championships in a row. Big deal. Yeah. And they, they, I mean, I was in awe. They, we, we turned up. I mean, I think I was wearing jeans and a shirt. Bears all turned up in like suits. And I stood next to Alan. I just remember standing looking at Alan Cunningham and Colin Irish and Cleve Lewis and just be like, wow, this is, this is amazing. Like, we're not going to, there's no way we're going to win. It's going to be the Bears. They, they just done the three P. I just watched them on Sky and like, because yeah, yeah, yeah. tickets. And we, <laughs> we won it. Like really, the Worthing water polo team wins the wins the sports person, which apparently the Bears had won consecutively. So we win oh. it, and I just remember them leave. They just left. I thought, from my recollection, they literally they announced them. They <laughs> went up on the stage thing, and <laughs> they just left. Oh, pops is here. Pops is like that, crying because all these heroes are walking out of the room. <laughs> I don't want the award. I don't want the award. I was gutted. I Alan, come and have my award. I was gutted. That's hilarious, man. Yeah, absolutely. That is so funny. But isn't it funny how, like, highly, you you know, heroes and all that, you just... Oh, they're legends. You know, I mean, it's... Life is, is very, very odd. Um, yeah. It really I mean, to is. This, to this day, I don't know if you're the same. Daily, we're obviously driving a bus around all day. I, I don't have a lot of other things to think about. I regularly think about what would be the greatest BBL starting five of all time. That one or two positions for me changes here and there. I thought I, the other day I sat and I literally thought, what would a Bears all time five look like? And I couldn't do it. Yeah. I couldn't do it. The, only, that- two, the only two definite names on there is Alan Cunningham and Colin Irish. Mm. And, and then I just thought, 
I couldn't do the rest. I just yeah. I could not. I mean, her, I'd probably have Herman Harid in there, but he only played two seasons. But they were two seasons. Well, it's, the it, it's it's the same with anything you try and do. It's like mm. if if someone says all time NBA team, it's actually pretty hard to do. Uh, I've, I find that easier. Well, you, I get it, but you know, you kind of you got to base it on a few things. It's like right, who yeah, is definitely legit, criteria, the, the, yeah. the greatest five ever. But then you sort of start thinking, yeah, but he was one of my favourite players and no one's See, heard yeah, of them. That's different though, isn't it? Is you know, Because like, if I had my favourite Bears team, I'd still find it hard to do. But exactly. he wouldn't have half the players that would be in the best team ever. Exactly. And it's like, you can do it with anything. Your, 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 your ultimate band line-up. Oh, impossible. You know, your, your ultimate hip-hop crew. Mm. You know what I mean? And it's just so personal. I mean... <laughs> But then there's things that are just undeniable. Mm. You know what I mean? And, you know, you and me are forever being chastised in, in groups when we get talking about 90s NBA and 80s NBA compared to now. Is, 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 let's do a couple of like quick fires here. I've written a few down for you. What thing do you hate about the game in the modern day? Oh. Well, there's one thing I hate. I don't know how influential it is. I hate that they don't have tip-offs anymore. I hate the arrow. I hate the, the possession arrow. I want jump balls. Yeah. That's, I love that's it. the thing that springs to mind. I mean, what I mine is? Say. Yeah, go on. I've got two. I've got two. And I was talking about both of these. Again, I was droning in the great Joe Forbes here last night at the, the, the Magic and uh, even he was losing the world to live by the end of my <laughs> onslaught of why everything is now shit um, and people are going to get on me for this but do you know what I hate most about modern basketball? Cool. The three point shot <laughs> There's one and the second thing is I hate that the five doesn't exist anymore what, the five, uh, five the position. possession? Yeah. No, no, the, 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 the position. Oh, the, the, right. The big man role. The traditional big man. Yeah, that sucks. There's no... no. Do you know what? I was listening to Bill Simmons' podcast and he had Ryan Rossillo, who I think is absolutely brilliant. And um, they were breaking down game two, I think it was, game one or two from Boston... Golden State mm. and he was saying there's no advantage on a mismatch anymore in terms of the post player like no. if, if Steph Curry miss, if Steph Curry gets a mismatch with a big man he's got him on roller skates and he's you yeah. know, he's got the advantage you, when you see even Clay Thompson when he took uh, what's his the little Pritchard I think his name is the, the young dude who plays for Boston mm. he was ta- he was putting him in the low post Mm. And he's calling for the ball because he's got a small guy on him. But then when he got the ball, he didn't have any post moves <laughs> because no one has post moves anymore. You know, it's like, I know we sort of <laughs> fantasize about things like this, much to the annoyance of our below the rim chat group. But I long to see what would happen if you dropped Shaq oh, mate. into a modern NBA game. Mm. Because the you know you look at the people who are who on paper play his position that doesn't exist anymore, like Kevin Durant, who oh, mm. shoots threes, handles like a point guard. It I mean, I, 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 I get, I get that it is it is changed, and the athletes are now. It's supercharged basically and to see a seven foot guy do what Kevin Durant does is pretty incredible mm. but at the same time I find it utterly boring because to me the five is the big guy in the middle who you get the ball to who destroys everything around him and facialises people and I'm talking work, yeah. I'm talking you know if you go further back Wilt Chamberlain Kareem, 
I'm talking Walker later on. I'm talking. I'm talking about Shaq. I'm talking about um, Patrick Ewing, David Hickey, Robinson. Like Sean, David Robinson. Well, that David Robinson started centers. the problem by by taking threes quite often. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> let's blame him. Let's blame the admiral. But do you know what I mean? It's it's like who in the NBA is is gonna match up to Shaq? Well, there's that thing recently, wasn't there? Rudy Gobert said he would he would shut him down. Really? And I beg to laugh. differ. It's yeah, just, it, I no, beg to he differ. He wouldn't have a chance. You know. But like you say, it's, who, it's so different now. Who can contain a power forward who is six foot four called Charles Barkley? Do you know what? I think Charles's game translates maybe a little bit better than some because he had he could shoot the three. But he could also... Pull 15 drive. rebounds down. Oh, God, yeah. He would knock bodies flying. It's the same like Dennis Rodman's athleticism would blend in today. Obviously, his shooting wouldn't. But his athletic but what, ability... It just drives me up the wall where... And I see it in youth basketball all the time. The three-point shot is... <laughs> it, I'm telling you now, I'll bet you anything, right, that within 10 years, the NBA will have a four-point line or something. They've already talked about it, haven't they? Yeah. Because it's like... You see... You know, if you saw in the 90s, you saw someone shoot from just inside the halfway line and hit a three, it'd be the highlight of the week. It'd be a buzzer. It'd be a buzzer yeah. No other reason yeah. for it. Whereas now, Steph Curry yeah. will put up a shot with a guy in front of him and it's money. He's, he's it, changed the game more than any player. I mean, Steph Curry's amazing. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, he in terms must, of being, a, sh- being a shooter and everything like that. But I remember arguing with a guy um, who told me that um, Steph Curry could beat Iver- Alan Iverson in a game of one-on-one. Mm. And just going, shut up. Yeah, different, different, different. It's just different. It just, it, you know. You feel like Iverson's a lot tougher I, 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 for starters. <laughs> And just had Steph Curry couldn't handle um, Alan Iverson. No, Steph's got no defense anyway. <laughs> well, he's, he know, played a bit better the other week, but who, who, you know, what I mean, name me a player in the league that could handle Iverson. But there's, that's it. There's players from that generation that people can't handle. Yeah, like Kobe put up sixty, and he was he was done, finished. Yeah, he could he still put up sixty in his last game. Yeah, it's it's still there to do, and people people say players like. MJ Iverson would probably average low forties. Mm. But the thing is, it's, game. It, you know, it's it's always so a controversial one to talk about Kobe Bryant now. Oh, but yeah, you, you know, Kobe Bryant for me, great as he was, by his own admission, just mimics Jordan. Yeah, he even looked like him. Mm. His style of shot, the way he dribbled, the way the way he, he celebrated a shot, the yeah. way he so you know what I mean. He bought, he modelled himself on Michael mm. Jordan and brought it a bit more into the modern game. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. You all right? I don't know what. I don't know. Yeah. So yeah, cut that bit. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's like you know, and, and you and me obviously argue with Greg and Mikey and whoever else is is willing to get involved about. Not anymore. I've left the group. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And it's just like, don't even. No. I won't. I won't name names, but I got called out in in, uh, in that group for first of all something I didn't say. Second of all, a point that wasn't, it was like a build up, it, it was a piece towards an actual point. It wasn't even a, it wasn't the point of what I was saying, if you see what I mean. Which brings me to my next quick fire question. <laughs> what do you hate most about British basketball? I, there's not one thing, it's an amalgamation of things. <laughs> it's, 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 it's the the interaction with players is fantastic. The way you can get an interview or and, and and players want to do things like that, and the way I've got involved at the Patriots is fantastic, and doing the commentary is fantastic. But 
there is kind of a, a level above that I don't think we'll ever break into. The likes of you know the the commentary team that does Sky stuff, for example, we're not. There's no way anybody outside is getting into that. Mm. Um, even even the media aspects of it related to that as well. Kind of, I know I do. I, I write for the for the local paper and the local website and everything. But that's like I feel like that's the ceiling. I don't think we're gonna get any higher than that. That annoys me. But the just the negativity, like even and it was quite funny. It was funny. I was really I was crying with laughter. I don't know if anybody's seen it. The BBL polls stuff that, and it's I was doing it. I was putting these polls up, uh, and it's it's kind of old, a bit retro. A lot of retro names and things like that. And I put three coaches three or four coaches to people to choose to bring back if their team lost their coach for this season. What co- Who are you bringing back? And I put Billy Mims, Mick Bett, Mark Dunning. I can't remember if I put anyone else. <laughs> I've then commented it as me underneath saying, oh, wow, what a selection, like Hall of Fame coaches. And the first comment after that was Dave Forrester saying, Hall of Fame coaches, I think you'd have to check the records first. I believe one of them lost 50 games in a row. And I was like, for fuck's sake. Yeah. <laughs> Not yeah. the point. I think I caught, I, I put the uh, gif up from Anchorman saying you're a smelly, <laughs> smelly pirate yeah, I hooker. I did see that. I did see that. I really <laughs> and laughed. I just cried. And That's I just put, just choose one. And he blessed him. He picked one straight after. There's nothing weird. I mean, ah, this is hard. <laughs> how can I put this now? Because you well, and me uh, negativity you is and me, bullshit are stat geeks in a lot of way. Like, I will happily yes. sit yeah. and read stats, NBA, BBL, yes. whatever. Mm. But there's like this sort of subculture of people. That Deep take, analytics. That take it to a, a level that it doesn't yeah. need to go. There was a guy, I forget yeah. his name, he used to do analytics for the Giants. And after every game, they'd be like, oh, and today, so-and-so, um, became the first Giants player since 1984 to score uh, a two-point jump shot from 14 feet away in the third second of the third quarter. We're wearing number 11. <laughs> yeah, ma- making him the all-time um, leader in Giants history of shooting 14-foot jump shots in the second <laughs> second of the third quarter. And you're just reading it going, that's not a start, that's just... It's too much. That's yeah. like I deep what? analytics I don't get at all. I don't you know, and it's like you, I forget who it was now, but I was reading it going, Jeez, I bet the guy that, that he's come up with that stat for is embarrassed by that. He's probably happy with it. He's probably more than happy with it. Oh, I don't know, man. It's a bit like, oh come on, you know what I mean? I played four seconds in that game and you've told me that I'm the all time leader <laughs> in fucking you know yeah. what I mean? Taking I don't get the, the deep analytics. The, yeah, yeah. This is the, this player has taken more steps to and from the bench <laughs> in the fourth quarter than any other player in the history of the BBL. At the um, at the same time, like like you say, we we I love a stat. I, I you know I'm I'm a big fan of of a relevant stat, shall we say? But what I what I really have started to hate, and this is something else I hate about probably basketball in general is. When people say shouldn't be about stats, shouldn't have anything to do with stats. Well, it's like, what does that statement mean? Because, well, yeah. let's be honest, the game is won on points scored, rebounds I mean, made, and as a byproduct of that, assists. Like you, I've always said, you can't hide from your index score. No, and no. When, the when index, people say, people I, I, are like, oh, well, it shouldn't be. Down I, to that. Well, there's there's a pattern emerging. I with find MVPs and all sorts, and the pattern is their M, their index score. They'll be in the top ten. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, I find the plus and minus stuff utterly pointless. Oh, I that's bollocks! I, I yeah. don't get that. I don't think it's necessary. Mm. Whereas you can't lie with an index. Nope. Because that is an index based on facts. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean. How how it's, the, more, it's an amalgamation of numbers. Yeah, yeah. How the how, irrelevant. Yeah. how the equation works, I don't really know, and I don't really want to know either. But it's a very good stat. Hmm. You know what I mean? Whereas all this plus minus 
Do you know what I mean? It's like, mm. well, you know, ultimately, what does that mean and what does it prove? Well, not very much. Now, I mean, there's the school of thought where, you know, I mean, we created the greatest column in the world, the JLC. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 you know, there is that one way you're going, okay, so you've got that column for people that, you know, go above and beyond. But a lot of the time, even players that are JLC in it, will have a good stat line somewhere along the way. Of course they will. Of course they Whether will. Whether it's... It, Joe you know, herself, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, it's it's like if you want to put it on another plateau, it's like, you, you know, um, who can we say is the, you know, a, 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 a world-famous version of the JLC? De- Dennis Rodman. Dennis, yeah. But then again, like you say, he averaged like double yeah. figures for rebounds well, for his career. Do you remember the game when he, he scored zero points but went for 30 rebounds? Yeah. You know, and, and I think... And I, something like six blocks or something. I think, well, he, yeah. I think he since admitted that he went out of his way to not score a basket in that game. Yeah. And when, <laughs> when someone said, why would you do that? He's like, well, why do I need to score when Michael Jordan and Scotty Pippen are on the team? <laughs> and it's like, well, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, it's that one in it where it's like, you know, can you honestly leave Dennis Rodman out of the the greatest defensive team of all time? No, of course I, you can. I don't think you can. He's starting in an all defensive team. Exactly. It's not even close. But this is but things like this, like the stats going too deep, drilling down deep into some stat. I get it, if you're a coach, maybe you need to look really deeply at, you know, certain players that shoot particularly well from specific places or whatever. Yeah. But when it comes to... Like, this is what really annoyed me with when we looked at the BBL team of the season and, and Darian Nelson-Henry. And I've got an absolute... The guy is great. Team captain. He's a, he's a warrior. He plays tough. He plays hard. And he's a very good player. But he only plays 20 minutes a game. Mm. So statistically, everything he does beyond that is hypothetical. Yeah. So people are saying, well, you know, look at his efficiency in 20 minutes. What if he played another, you know, if he played 40 minutes? It doesn't equate like that. Do you know what I mean? It's it's not, a, it's not, if he played 40 minutes, he'd have a different role on the team. Like, he wouldn't be the role player that he is. I mean, without harping back to the 90s again, <laughs> which I'm going to do, where <laughs> the index wasn't really a thing, or it no. just wasn't a thing, you're sort of thinking about it going, all right, well, at NBA level, what would Michael Jordan's index be? Oh my god! It's scary to think, you know. In the fifties, yeah. In the BBL, what would Dorsey's index be? What would yeah. Colin Irish's index be? Yeah. You know, what I mean, what would Cunningham's Russ index Saunders. be? Russ, Russ Saunders. Saunders' index would have been mental. You know, what would Nigel Lloyd's yeah index be? You know, and yeah, that's a start. Crazy. It's a modern start in it. Mm. So, you know, they managed to pull together teams of the season without the index. But I think that when you're trying to pick a team in the season now, the index is a pretty valuable commodity because it, it gives is. you a good snapshot of that person's productivity. All round ability. Yeah. All round, because you can then average it for the season. Mm. And it's it's mm. almost like doing the job for you, isn't it? You don't have to then go, all right, well, he averaged this many points, but only this many assists. Mm. It's, it's kind of self made, isn't it? So it's, it's a, an amalgamation, yeah. Yeah. So it's just like, yeah, I, I know what you're saying. And, and, Listen, and that's the should... thing. The, oh, go on. The, the, the British basketball is so. I mean, I, don't, I can't. Self, even, self-destructive. I, I can't even sit here and say it's just full of grumpy old men because we are the epitome of grumpy <laughs> old men. And, you know, the people that listen to our show going, I wish them two would just shut up about the 80s and the 90s. But <laughs> it's the era that we, you know, thank God we were there. Hmm. Because the difference between the game in the 70s and 80s to the 90s wasn't so dramatic like hmm. the 90s to the 2022 you know, okay. So in back in the day, there wasn't a three point line. You know what I mean? It was like you, you didn't have the acrobatic dunkers and all that kind of stuff. But fundamentally, basketball was games were won from field goals, from yeah. two point shots. 
Yeah. And when people come to me and say, yeah, but the three point shot is how Steph Curry wins games and his scoring mm. average is what it is. I'm like, yeah, but Steph Curry's scoring average doesn't come close to Michael Jordan's who's, no. who's, who made a career out of a mid range jump shot mm. and won everything. And get into so the basket. Don't yeah. don't tell me that Steph Curry or you know freaks of nature like LeBron James are more important to the game. Hmm. Can you imagine what Larry Bird's index would be. Mate, Larry, Larry's or, in my all time. Or, or Magic Johnson. See, this is a funny thing. In the nineties, I hated Larry Bird. I just thought he was totally uncool. I thought he looked like a goon. Um, I didn't like the Celtics because I just thought they were like this sort of, you know, sort of Man United of, <laughs> of, of the NBA. But I'll tell you what, man, once I checked myself, you know, yeah. about yeah, yeah. 20 years ago, and like I'll find myself going on Larry Bird binges regularly. He's great. Cause, cause, cause that the guy, stories about him are amazing as well. The trash talk, the, that guy is just... He he has one of the best three year stretches of any player in the history of the NBA. Yeah, yeah. Three, he had it. The tragedy, yeah, I mean, three he had titles, a, three finals MVPs, two MVPs, all in three years. Well, he had a short career when you think about yeah, it. Yeah, done his back in. It, it was done by nineteen ninety. Yeah, he was. He, he. Do you know how he did his back in? Mowing his lawn. Doing doing his mum's drive, I think. Yeah, he was, yeah. He wouldn't. He wouldn't pay anyone to do it, to re, resurface his drive, so he did it himself and put his back out. One of the best documentaries I've ever seen about basketball is the one about uh, Magic and Larry. It's brilliant, and it? it's on YouTube now as well. Uh, yeah, and how they really didn't like each other, but then they became friends doing yeah. a commercial. Yeah, uh, the sneakers. Yeah, the sneakers. And, and the respect that those two guys have for one another is just it's brilliant. Yeah, it's just on another plateau, isn't it? Mm, definitely, definitely. Listen, we should. We're over. We're almost two and a half hours. We should. Um, well, this is we'll a two-part special, isn't it? I want to know, before we go, I don't know if you've given any thought to this. Mm. One game. It doesn't even have to be a championship game or, or uh, anything specific. But personally to you, one one game can be Giants, can be Bulls, can be Atlanta Hawks, whatever, that you were either at and watched or you watched live that means the most to you game that means the most to me I mean it was the most entertained you've been or or (laughs) just whatever the thing is though the greatest game that I've ever was at is the one that I go on about all the time the Giants Sheffield game and league decider yeah yeah, yeah. up until the third quarter it wasn't actually that great of a game um the Giants (laughs) were were pretty slow off the block in fact and and, Mm. It was they the got themselves back quarter. into it, didn't they? Yeah, it was the fourth quarter and what they did to get back into the game. Um, and obviously, I mean, it's a historic moment, you know, mm. and, and, you know, in British basketball to say you were there, it was like, yeah, I was fucking there and I had the perfect shot of Terrell Myers Knocking you know, it put, putting it down. But I think that, that that game, because for me, that was one of the greatest Giants teams ever. Mm. And the great Tony Dorsey was doing what Tony Dorsey did. And to, to, to 20 odd years later, be friends with Tony Dorsey. Oh, amazing. And speak to him and have him on this show when we did to watch that game. Mm. It doesn't really compute, you know, uh, yeah. much, much like having the privilege of talking to Phil Handy after Toronto won. Mm. championship you know you, you can't get your head around things like that so right. certainly that one but I don't know I think that NBA wise there's games that, that stick out for me um, because I used to watch them over and over again yeah yeah yeah, yeah I'm the same the, 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 the one game that I used to watch all the time was Jordan's 55 point game against New York Oh yeah, went on the comeback. On the comeback, yeah, the double nickel. Uh, yeah. Because it was what his fourth, fifth game back. Yeah, at Madison Square Garden. At the Garden, and he won the game at the death. 
Mm. Not, but not with a shot, but with an assist. Yes, right. Dished it. So it's a Will Purdue, and I've yeah. watched that game many times, and I don't know. It's it's just one of my favorite favorite Jordan games. It's like the redemption, you know. What I he mean? was it, back it, officially. It's like it? that was the official. I am back because I'd watched every game of the comeback, and he hadn't been Jordan. Mm. I mean, he in the th- I remember in the third game back, he beat my Hawks with a buzzer beater in Atlanta. Yes, that's um, right. On which Smith, was Steve like, Smith, yeah, even though like, he was holding him around the waist. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's like, okay, he, he, he still got it. But then when he came and did that, it 55, was like, yeah. yeah. I, liked, I liked Pat Riley's uh, interview after the game. Yeah. When he says uh, he's, he... Got some, I think he says well, something like he got momentum against, might have been Atlanta, and then uh, of course he does it against us, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but holds his head in his hands, like, of course, he's, he's he did it against us, yeah. Be- before you tell me what yours is, the, the, the series that I'll never forget because of just everything that was going on in my life at the time, and mm. to me, was era defining, was the '96 finals. Mm. The, the Bulls and the Sonics because it was 1996 for me. If someone says, what's the best year you've ever had? I always say 1996. Damn. And it was because everything in my life at the time had fallen into place. You know mm. what I mean? Mm. Um, culturally, musically, basketball, you know, yeah. I the, the, the think two days after that, I went off to America for the summer Um Sort of riding, you know, buzzing about the um, the, the Bulls winning, yeah. and um, I was in Atlanta for the Olympics in '96. Oh wow! So you know, there was all that hype, and it was just it was the fucking best year ever for me. Mm. Um, so yeah, that Seattle series that was cool. He won it on Father's Day as well, didn't he? Yeah, with all the stigma that went along with that. Yeah, what's yours? Well, the the more so, I've got a few more so since they released the the what they call the game six, the movie, where they used all the the special slow movie cameras. The Jordan's last game in a Bulls jersey. Right. Okay. It's 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 awesome, especially that that movie cut of it. It's on YouTube, where they use all the special movies that they would then I mean, put into the, yeah, the productions. Yeah. It's phenomenal. It's- that last twenty seconds of that game, oh. you got to see the. Still entire, don't know how they won it. <laughs> well, you, you you got to see the entire Jordan repertoire in yeah. twenty seconds, and it was the last twenty. It was almost like he wanted to sum up his career in the last twenty seconds of a game. In mm. a game, was it game six or seven? Game six, yeah. Yeah, it, it was like right. It's game six. I'm going to give the world one. They wouldn't last. have won if it had gone to seven games. Yeah. I'm going to give the world one last yeah. show of Michael Jordan. And you got to see Jordan, the great defender, Jordan, the great handler, and mm. Jordan, the greatest game finisher of all yeah. time. It was phenomenal. So that that is definitely up there. But And the 93 final, um, where Steve Nelson, this is 93 BBL final. BBL, yeah, yeah. Steve Nelson wins it from the free throw line and then Colin Irish, in my opinion, and the referee's opinion, clean yeah. block. On, yeah. I think it's Lester James who goes up. I can't remember. It might have been Mike Obaseki, but that finish to that game was just absolutely phenomenal. It's one of the best playoff games of all time. Mm. Um, but weirdly, it, it's before Alan Cunningham, Colin Irish, Cleve Lewis, and all these guys came... It's the season before that, when it was still Ronnie Baker, Leo Rogers. Uh, we had Brian Heron, who was amazing, power forward, and Dale Shackelford. We had Mike Spade still then as well. I know Mike Spade was there still through the uh, Cunningham era. But we have Mike Spade, uh, Mark Hubbard, three point specialist, still has still up there in terms of three point percentage, and they. It was the first time we beat Kingston Kings it, it, since moved coming to the BBL and Kingston Kings had only lost three games in two years or something. 
uh, and it was Chris. I think it was the game before Christmas. And the standard form was we would go up teams like that and teams like Sunderland, who had like uh, Steve Butnell and Russ Russ Saunders and all these guys. Well, actually, Russ Saunders was at Kingston by this point. So this is the Kingston Super Team that has Alan Cunningham, Alton Bird, Colin Irish, yeah. Martin Henlon, Russ Saunders, like. These every single one of them. If it didn't say England or GB, it had a. It was a. You know, it said their college. Yeah, yeah. It was one of them squads. It was a phenomenal team. And uh, and we beat them. And the, the the norm was we would go up. I mean, it happened in all games. We went up. We'd go up, be up by double digits. Uh, and Kings particularly wouldn't give a shit. They would just methodically wear you down and beat you. It's what they did, but not this time. We held on, and and I just remember it coming down to the final few seconds, and I think Ronnie Baker forced a steal, and and rather than dribble out or put up a shot, he just threw he threw the ball straight up in the air, and it it just it seemed to stay up there for about five seconds, and then the buzzer went, and uh, my dad was one of the first ones on the court. There was a pitch. Oh really? Caught him, yeah, my old man. Wow. Just like grabbed me by the hand, and we ran down the backs of all the seats, yeah. and we were on the court with him. It was phenomenal. And I, I have the, the program is on my bedside table. Wow, <laughs> it's my, it's yeah, my, it, it, that's that's the best. That's my, the, that's the best game I've been at. It was phenomenal. It's it's all, it's hard, isn't it? Because there's 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 small games that I've been at. You know, one of like one of my favourite games of, of recent history was watching the the, the Magic win, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. the playoff finals a few. That weeks was back that in, was amazing in, in, in overtime. That was an incredible you know, game. Cause, cause they were dead was, and buried twice. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, it, and it was the moment the guys that were on the floor and all the above. Yeah, it was just perfect. Phenomenal. Right, my man. All right. I think we will call it. We should do, we'll do this again, I think, as the uh, as the summer goes on. Might as well. Because it's... Uh, Pick a topic sort of thing. It's a weirdly long, dark period when there's not much BBR going on. I know the three-on-three has been going on, but I've been at work, so I've missed all that. And I know GB's coming up. We really want to try and get a GB player on the show, I think. Yeah, we can do that. <laughs> But we'll get so we'll get some we'll do a, we'll do an all time BBL draft which could be interesting because there's obviously members of the below the rim team that are from different generations that could be an interesting uh, topic um, and the movie the movie draft. Oh, funnily enough, um, have you seen the new Adam Sandler film? Not yet. I've got I watched it. Watched it last it's, night. It's in my list. It's really good. I'm trying really to convince good. the wife to watch it because it's Adam Sandler. But I don't uh, know. Uh, it's really good. It's a serious one again, isn't it? Because it's the same guy yeah, who yeah, yeah. cut gems, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's serious, but it's, it's funny as well. And it's yeah. got like loads of NBA players in it. Mm. No, it's, I've, I've, it's got good reviews, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna watch that. We need to do. We should do a movie review thing as well. Yeah. A TV show review. I've, I've got to send you Winning Time because that was in, that was amazing. Yeah, if you could, that was brilliant. I'm a big fan of Winning Time. I yeah, I'm awesome. desperate to see that. But I just I know there's a lot of a lot of controversy surrounding it, but yeah, I'd imagine it was great. Kareem, the character who plays Kareem, I just loved. And and I've got Kareem is in my. I've got Kareem above Shaq, which might piss people off, but mm-hmm. yeah, I'm, a big, I'm a big Kareem fan. If you can figure a way of sending me that, that'd be awesome no worries anyway alright thank you sir and thank you at home for for listening Uh, until next time take it easy we'll speak to you soon